All of the Fretboard Journal podcasts are brought to you by a few presenting sponsors. First up is Martin Guitars. Martin Guitars and Strings remain the choice for musicians around the world for their unrivaled quality, craftsmanship, and tone. Then we have Carter Vintage Guitars over in Nashville, where guitar lovers go for a good time. Also, Gibson Guitars. Only a Gibson is good enough. And we have a brand new presenting sponsor, Calton Cases. Your custom instrument deserves a custom case. Thank you to all of our presenting sponsors. Welcome back to another episode of the Fretboard Journal Podcast. As always, that's John Rauhaus playing in the background. And I am Jason Verlindi the founder and editor of the Fretboard Journal magazine, which I should say is celebrating its 15th year in existence right now. We just put out Fretboard Journal 46. It's mailing to everyone around the world right now. And if you want to get it, if you want in on the fun, you can go to fretboardjournal.com and click on that subscribe tab. We have, of course, our keepsake print edition, which we are known for. It's basically a coffee table book that is a guitar magazine. And we also now have new uh, Fretboard Journal digital subscriptions. It's a PDF edition that mails to you immediately, no matter where in the world you are. And you can get four issues of that for just $30 a year and support not only our magazine and our contributors, but also this podcast and all the videos that we post for free and everything else that we do. We are a reader-supported magazine, not a lot of advertising in anything we do. We're not trying to push much down anyone's throats. And so our readers and our listeners like you really help uh, pay the bills, keep the lights on, and allow us to do all of this fun stuff that we do every week. So Eddie Van Halen, guitar god, passed away this week at the age of 65. Super sad, super tragic. Uh, We never, of course, got to interview him. He wasn't much for doing many interviews since we've been around. But uh, as I was thinking about this podcast... I thought, A, I bet a bunch of you have some great Eddie Van Halen and Van Halen stories, and I would love to hear those either for a future episode of the podcast or maybe for a magazine article. Please reach out to me, podcast at fretboardjournal.com, and I will share them. And then I was thinking about what the actual episode would be this week, and uh, of all the podcasts we had in the can, I picked the most rock and roll one as a, a small tribute to Eddie Van Halen and all that he did. This one is going to be quite entertaining. I hope you have your favorite beverage next to you and a comfy chair because I'm talking to the legendary tour manager, live sound engineer, jack of all trades, known simply as Night Bob. Night Bob has had a storied career that goes back almost 50 years. He's worked alongside the New York Dolls, Iggy Pop and the Stooges, R.E.M., Aerosmith, Emerson, Lake and Palmer, Ace Frehley, and Steely Dan, and so many others. Uh, Les Zeppelin, I know he was working with until recently when COVID kind of stopped his career with uh, lack of touring and stuff. But uh, Night Bob, I first got introduced to uh, a few years ago. We were, I was putting together a story on the guitars of Walter Becker which many of which went up for auction recently. And uh, Walter really supported independent builders like few other music heroes have. Chiho Han, Doug Cower, Cower Guitars, Roger Sadowski back in the day, Satellite Amplifiers, all of these independent builders who don't make a ton of guitars were getting order after order from Walter Becker of Steely Dan, and he was showcasing their instruments on stage and sometimes just hoarding their gear in his gear locker. But um, I wanted to get the story behind that, so I interviewed a bunch of luthiers for the Fretboard Journal's second electric guitar annual, and really all fingers pointed back to Night Bob. So I talked to Night Bob for that story. Night Bob was really the guy who took Becker under his wing in some ways and told him about this amazing world of boutique makers They had quite a budget, so they were able to buy some prime examples. They were able to have a lot of fun experimenting with all sorts of stuff at um, SIR and other places, figuring out what would be the best parts caster and all this other stuff. I had a blast talking to Night Bob for that article. We talked for like three hours just about Walter Becker, and it felt like we barely scratched the surface. So with COVID and everything else, I re-reached out to Night Bob and said, hey, we've got to get the rest of your story 
chronicled and, and can you be on the fretboard journal podcast he graciously agreed to and i'm considering this long interview to be the first of many long interviews with night bob because i know he's got a lot more stories yes i pitched him and said he needs to write a memoir and yes i said he needs to host his own podcast and maybe one day he will but until then i think every few months i'm just going to call night bob check in see how he's doing and uh, get him to tell some stories for all of us before we get to that uh, we do have a couple of sponsors who help support this podcast. Mono, monocreators.com is where you can read up on their entire lineup of gig bags and studio monitor stands and pedal boards and pedal board bags. Everything that Mono creates, super well built, super ergonomic, no fluff, just really bulletproof, really well built. I love my Mono Vertigo case. And if you are looking for a gig bag or anything else that they produce, I don't think you can go wrong with any of their products. So go to monocreators.com and see what I'm talking about. Our other sponsor is our friends over in New York City at Retrofret Vintage Guitars, which, speaking of Becker, have had their fair share of Walter Becker-owned gear for sale over the last few months. And uh, I go to their new arrivals page every week as I introduce this podcast, and I always see amazing gear that I think you will love or that I know I would personally love. Right now they have a 57 Fender Princeton 5F2 in stock. They've also got a 57 Fender Harvard in stock. They have a 66 Gibson Trini Lopez available right now and a 1967 Guild M65 in the sunburst finish, which is super cool. Uh, Go to retrofret.com. Tell them the fretboard journal sent you. I know they're shipping and getting new gear all the time so reach out to them if you're looking for anything even if it's not on their new arrivals or uh, current inventory page i bet they'll be able to help you out and tell them the fretboard journal sent you all right this is my conversation with night bob again the fretboard journal's 46th issue is available now i would love it if you would support us if you've just been enjoying the podcast uh, like i said we've got that digital option which i'll include a link to in the show notes it's just 30 dollars and you will get four PDF editions of the Fretboard Journal and all the great stories, which are where we really focus most of our energy. And if there are any Night Bob fans out there who are uh, listening and want to dig a little bit deeper into some of the stuff we're talking about, I should add that I talked to Adam from Satellite Amplifiers, another person who uh, Becker supported over the years, and an incredible amp builder down in San Diego on our sister podcast, The Truth About Vintage Amps. So uh, if you go back, it was right at the beginning of the year, pre-COVID, and uh, there is a special bonus episode of The Truth About Vintage Amps podcast with Adam Grimm from Satellite that I think everybody would dig because we talk a little bit more about some of this stuff. But in the meantime, sit back and enjoy my first of hopefully many conversations with the one and only Night Bob. I hope you enjoy it. I'm a solid body guy, you know, I have solid body guitars, you know, and it's, it's like uh, that into itself is sort of like, you know, I mean, like, um, this is, you might find this funny. I don't even own an acoustic guitar. It's amazing. Well, is it, well, you know, it's like, listen, I've, I've been doing the guitar, the guitar thing for maybe 60 years. Right. And my first guitar was bought used from a music store. So that like set me off. You know, why would you want to pay this Mm -hmm. when you can get the the funny thing was I wanted a strap really bad. Right. And the strap was like uh, when I was looking for my first guitar, it was like one hundred and seventy dollars. Okay. Right. And my old man thought that that was an awful lot of a lot of money to put into something. You didn't know if I would stick with it, right? So I went to this music store. He goes, "What do you have this used, right?" And so they showed him and, and me a, uh, a 1958 ES225 plan and two P90s uh-huh. trap piece, scale piece, right? I could get that for ninety bucks. <laughs> it's so a I great it. first guitar. I, I still have it. <laughs> I wish I could say that about maybe two or three hundred other guitars that have come to you know pass through my hands, you know. But I still have it. It was a good, you know, and it set me. It was funny because I was like kind of disappointed. I wanted that sexy Stratocaster, and like my old man was a jazz guy, right? So he was uh, um, and an electrical engineer. You know, he was like only a Gibson is good enough, you know. And I was like, oh, okay, whatever you say. <laughs> And that started me on my decline. The um, the funny thing was is that my parents they were 
both my mother made tubes for RCA. Are you kidding in the next me? Town from us. No, wow. She worked in the the RCA tube manufacturing plant in Harrison, New Jersey, and my father was an electrical engineer for like this really off the radar company called Kirfot that made missile guidance systems, worked on the lunar landing module, stuff like that. Right? So I've been around the technology and uh, I had smart people, smart parents, right? So at one point they told me and my sister that they said, you know, part of you know your education should be you should play an instrument. Right, so you, here's what we want you to do. Right, we want you to sit down and figure out what instrument you would like to play, and we would ask, we will get you that instrument, and we ask you to put a year into it. After the year, if you're done with it, that's fine. Right, and so we're. I was like seven years old, and I was like, what? And uh, so they sat us down in front of the TV and put on the Lawrence Welk show. Because Lawrence Welk, every instrument was featured in some way. You know what I mean? Sure. You could see everything from pedal steel to, you know, balalaika or whatever, right? So I, I was sitting there. My old man was a jazz guy. He thought that I should play saxophone, right? And like uh, when I saw Buddy Miller stand, uh, Buddy Merrill stand up and play that strap and an anodized picker, I was like, that's for me. <laughs> 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 and that's how it started. Yeah, it's pretty interesting. Yeah. What and, did your uh, mom do yeah. for the in terms of tubes? Was she like quality control? She was, she... Yeah, I think she was like at the end of a manufacturing line because I know when I was really little, you know, um, I was obsessed by satellites and rockets in outer space, right? And uh, my mother would uh, say, oh, you like that science fiction stuff? And she'd bring me two power tubes home because they were big and science fiction-y looking. Right. And I would, you know, use them as part of a diorama of a space station or whatever, you know. So there were always a lot of tubes around the house, you know. Uh, and yeah, I guess she was like, she got tested them at the end of the line. She was a photographer in the Second World War as well. Then both, both my parents were in the Navy. Interesting, you know. And, te- and in a technical kind of thing. Remind me where you grew up? I grew up in New Jersey, just outside of New York. Okay. Right across the river from Manhattan. So I went to Manhattan a lot. Yeah. So you get this beautiful Gibson as your first guitar, and then is it yep. is it garage bands right out of the gate? Uh, no, not really. I had to take some lessons first to get into that. And I had uh, my, first, my first two guitar teachers were abusive. <laughs> and I was going to give good. the instrument up. They were. Yeah, it was. It's fun. This one guy, he would hit my hand. If I put my fingers, if I didn't arch my fingers right, he would hit my hand with a pencil. Right. And at one point, I just had enough. <laughs> I told my father, this guy keeps hitting me. My father goes, I'll put an end to that. <laughs> and uh, now and then, like, uh, you know, you, you get to, I actually kind of, my uh, I, my sister stopped playing. I kept going. And, but my intro, you know, uh, garage bands was more like surf bands. I have pictures of a band where, uh, where it was like me, another guitar player and a drummer, no bass player. We couldn't find it, but who played bass. It was pretty funny. <laughs> and then like, uh, back in the nineties when all these no bass player bands started showing up, I was like, Hmm, I was way ahead of that. Curve. <laughs> you were way decades. <laughs> You know, and then, you know, it's a usual thing. You play the surf songs and then, you know, and then all of a sudden the Beatles come out and you want to, you know, uh, if you would find a singer who could sing, you know, or even, call, I remember I, we got this one guy to sing, man, because he would yell. And when he would yell, the veins would stick out in his neck. And we thought that was great. And that's the joy of being in, you know, music when you're a kid, you know, it's just like, it's just a big adventure. It's like the precursor and, to your work in the Stooges, not to get ahead of ourselves. <laughs> yeah, well, in a, in a way, yeah. You know, it's just like, you know, because it's a big release, you know, and it's like, I was, I could go on for hours about the purpose of music and life and all that kind of jazz, but I think that's, I could, you could go to uh, Roadie Free Radio and there's an hour and a half of me talking about uh what just basically what I told you just now and all the stuff that went on afterwards, right? I mean, I got into the music business because I started to do, I used to mix my own band, 
right? Like I said, my father was heavy tech, right? So he would like, uh, he would say, you know, he called me up once and he goes, listen, you know, because we're switching over to uh, to solid state amps here at the at the shop. He goes, like, so we have all these tube amps, right? So I can't give them to you and I can't sell them to you. I said, but they're going to be thrown in a dumpster. He goes around the end of the day today goes drive up to the gate tell charlie you're here to to meet me right drive by that dumpster and fill up the trunk with these two amps right so they turn out to be uh macintosh power ramps which they were using for like a pa system or, or something else no they're using them for vibration tables to um uh to see the effects of vibration on on the uh, gyroscopes and and electrical components like i said they, they made missile guidance systems and lunar landing module bits and shit like that so they had these vibration tables and they used these power amps so they, they they could they could you know uh record the slightest changes in uh circuits and uh and design and stuff like that so i got all these these macintosh power amps so i had a pretty good pa for a kid yeah, a lot of power. So you are a teenager. Yep. You're in bands, and your yeah. dad is this scientist type. And so are you? Immediately... Well, he's more. He was like an engineer. An he engineer. wasn't really, you know. I mean, he, you know, he he knew. Uh, scientist sounds too much like a, a guy in a lab coat. Sure. He was, you know, uh, it, he was an engineer, right? I mean, I remember like a big moment in my life. It's like when I went to visit him at at work. Or, you know, bring your kid to work day or something. He plugged the microphone into an oscilloscope and like, he goes, you want to see what your voice looks like? I was like, yeah. Right. <laughs> and talking to a microphone, and so, but it, you know, on a frequency analyzer and on the oscilloscope. And I was like, wow, it was so it was deep, you know, but back then, like this is a, I guess, post mid sixties, sure. early, you know, and uh, so you could, man, you could play all the time. You could play dances, you could play parties, you know, you, and it was great. I got into the music business because a friend of mine whose band that I would use, let him use my PA, right? He moved into professional band thing and he says, I can get you a job in New York City running a rehearsal studio at, you know, from like four till midnight. And the best part is you could rehearse your band for free. And I was like, this is the great, this is like the big, because at that point I would say, I wanted to be a guitar player. Within t- two weeks of working in that place, I realized that I was nowhere near as good as I needed to be. My first day at the job, I had, there were two studios and one studio was a uh, uh, Mahavishnu Orchestra. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, right. You Not know, so it's like, I'm like, oh, well, and, and the funny thing was, it was like, Back back then, people didn't, you know, all of a sudden didn't know very much, you know, because there's no internet, there's no guitar magazines, you know, it's sort of like roadies were basically guys who lifted and drove the truck, right? And John McLaughlin's Rex Bow double neck, there was no output, right? And they go, what are we going to do? <laughs> so I said, give me that, and, you know, and I just took a, took a screwdriver, took the jack blade off. I said there was, you know, the the ground was off the output jack. I soldered it back on, and all of a sudden I was a guitar repair guy. It was pretty funny. But also, when you see professional, when you were able to, I mean, I did six weeks at Johnny Winter rehearsals. I sat in front of him, right? And, uh, which was funny because uh, in a previous issue of your magazine, you were, um, Oh, what's his name? The guy for uh, the guy who sold Johnny Winter all his Firebirds. Oh gosh, um, yeah, I'm spacing on it, yeah. but yeah, I know. Uh, yeah, I know. yeah, that guy. You know, well, I met him at that rehearsal place when he brought three Firebirds for Johnny to buy, right? And um, that started really kind of started the old guitar thing going with me, right? Being there because you get to see all these things, you know. Things were cheap, right? And uh, and then people hit me to to like you know the, they used to have this thing in in the East Coast called the Want Ad Press, right? It would come out every Wednesday, and you would get this thing, and there'd be all these instruments for sale, right? And you know um, I would go buy these guitars, 
and then resell them in New York City, usually this, sometimes the same day. So I became, you know, like add to my income of working in the rehearsal studio, you know, or take them to the rehearsal studio and sell them to people there and cut out the middleman. I sold a lot of guitars to uh, Mr. Friedman at We Buy Guitars on 48th Street. And we had the, you know, Paramount Pawn before that, too. It was pretty funny. Yeah, so you are, I, I mean, it sounds like you were just destined for the career and the, the guitar habit that you had. You were clearly taking apart stuff as a teenager, and then it just naturally transitioned when you started working at this rehearsal space. Um, mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, and, and you would sell the guitars to both stores as well as just bring them into the rehearsal space and say, I just found this. Yeah. 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 Just like, you know, Hey, what's that? I go, Oh, that, that's it. What was your role at the like space I, beyond, uh, the I was, occasional I was side the hustle? Studio of selling? manager. Studio manager. Okay. I was the studio. I was the night manager. There, you know, all the business basically went on, uh, between four and six. That's how I got this nickname, right? Because the guy who ran uh, the studio during the day, his name was Bob, too. If you call between four and six because their shifts overlapped, the girl who answered the phone would go, I got, I got to speak to Bob about rehearsal. And she would go, the day Bob or the night Bob. And the, and the bands, that, you know, he got mostly the jazz bands that like they would, uh, you know, rehearse during the day and then go play club gigs or sessions or some shit like that, you know. And I got to see a lot of musicians, man. I mean, everybody from Miles Davis to Tony Williams to, uh, you know, I watched um, Billy Cobham rehearse his solo album with Jan Hammer and Tommy Boland. And he sat in the room. And I'm like, wow, this is really so deep that I don't know what to say about it, you know. I bought an echoplex from him. <laughs> wow. Still have it? Yeah. <laughs> nice. Yeah. It's a gray tube echoplex. It was like, you know, he was like he was looking for some spare cash. <laughs> Put it here that way. I go, wow, that's a nice I go, I don't think I've ever seen a, a gray one. And he goes, like, you want to buy it? Sixty bucks. And I was like, I'm in. Here you go. Does it work? <laughs> It's just kind of funny. Well, no, it still... just set me on my way, you know. I mean, I still, for a good uh, ten years after that, I still, I still wanted to be a guitar player. I just knew I had to work harder. And when you, when you get to be around a lot of really good players, you know, you can, and you can ask questions, you know, like why do you do that, or could you show me how you did that, and they'd be happy to show you, you know. Uh, so I got to pick up some some pointers and shit like that, you know. And uh, uh, one of the greatest things uh, that a guitar player told me, he said, like, listen, you have to understand your role in a popular song. You're the noise that happens when the singing stops. And he said to me, he goes, the average person, he goes, it's all about the vocal melody in the singing because it's talking that's where you communicate information or feeling it's all in in the vocal right and he goes to be honest it's all about kick snare and bass guitar that's what gets your foot tapping you know and your head bopping and all that because the rest of it is just bullshit he goes when you he goes you can work all your life you know learning all this these scales and all this stuff he goes but the thing you need to remember is that it's really you're playing six or seven seconds so you don't, you know, so you really don't have to, you know, unless you're playing an instrumental band, that's a whole other thing. He goes, you'll never, you'll never get beyond clubs uh, because, because the average person who will want to come to see you and buy your records is more vocally orientated. So just remember where you fit into this. And he goes, and the last thing he said to me, he goes, learn to write songs. And I was like, all right, thanks. Who was that? Uh, I don't want to reveal that right now. Okay. I'm going to save, I'm going to save that for another time. Well, just say a famous musician. Okay. If you want to use that bit. You know. I'm going to use all this I bit. Mean, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it, but it, you must have been this, I mean, it sounds like you were this incredible fly on the wall to some probably magical and also some infamous sessions. Um, yeah. At what mm -hmm. point did 
you transitioned because now, I mean, you're widely regarded as one of the great sound guys. At what point did you actually right. start twiddling knobs? Well, I bet from the, the first day I was at work, you know, um, uh, when I got that job, I mean, I'd mix some bands before I'd mix my own band from the side, you know, from the side. Of the, I knew what ba- I knew what a, uh, important thing is, is, is balance, the balance between instruments in a band. Right. And once you, you have that in your head, what the balance should be, how loud the vocal should be in, in regards to everything else, you're pretty much on your way. And back when I was starting to do this, it was not a whole lot of technology. Sure. You know, I mean, it's like, you, you know, some mixing consoles had a master tone knob, or if you're lucky, you had bass and treble. I know when I started working at the rehearsal studio, we used these eight channel Sun Coliseum mixers, right? And they had bass and treble. And I was like, whoa. <laughs> and graphic equalizers, which I'd seen in magazines, but mm-hmm. never actually used one, right? And they, you know, and I, I thought I was, I was in over my head. And they were like, no, it's all set up, you know? And, the, and uh, either Bob Coffey or Harry Popick, right? These two other guys, these two other audio guys, they said, listen, he goes, a lot of it, is is in perception he goes they'll ask for something you pretend to turn a knob and look at them and they'll go that's great and you haven't done anything you know so it's it's like you know you respond to them in some way and to you know just go this is like a big eye opener you know that they're they're listening in a different way than you're listening right so i mean it was really easy i worked there for a year and a half Right. And then everybody wanted to join the circus and get out of town, you know, because you see these touring bands and had old stories. And, you know, it's like Johnny Winter would tell me about this. And no, I was having some drinks with Janis Joplin. And, you know, and Jerry Garcia came over and I was like, oh, this is such a great thing. I want to do this, you know. And I got a job. I got uh, this is probably the most important thing, right? It's like through this joint, I met a lot of people from managers to recording engineers like Jay Messina and Jack Douglas, who went on, you know, Jack went on to be a major producer, right? And all these guys who worked for bands, right? And if you knew, you know, if you knew what you were doing, because they were always looking for some kind of help. So this friend of mine, Chris Young, right? He was, at the time I met him, he was working for Frampton's Camel, Peter Frampton's post Humble Pie Band. And we hung out and, uh, you know, because Frampton did like a month of rehearsals there. So I saw him in this, uh, you know, a lot. Right. And then at one point he came into town and said, listen, I'm, I'm gone from them. I'm on, oh, too bad. I was hoping I could get a gig with them. He goes, I got a better thing for you. I'm working for Emerson, Lake and Palmer. You want to go out and do a tour with Emerson, Lake and Palmer? <laughs> and I was like, yes, yes. So I went you know, I'd gotten a couple of offers before that, but they didn't, they didn't really turn out, you know, because there weren't that many engineers. You were kind of like a wizard, you know what I mean? Now the, the schools crank out hundreds of them, right? And um, which has really kind of made the business a bit messy, you know, because everybody can go to full sale for a couple of semesters and then think they know what they're doing and go out there and just like, you know, you know, attempt to to make things sound like and that's why when you go to concerts now you hear like the most the the featured thing seems to be the kick drum you know but uh but the people you meet you know i mean they called up and i went out and did for three months three and a half months with emerson lake and palmer doing five shows a week flying every day because emerson lake and palmer sold uh an immense amount of records in india Right. And at that point in the early 70s, you could not take cash out of India. So what they would do is they buy all these plane tickets on Air India. And back in the in like 1973, 74, if you had a ticket, it was good basically on any airline. So you could take these Air India tickets like going from uh, New York to Atlanta and just, you know, it's just underground book currency. flights. On, yeah. You know, yeah. And just book flight on American or something. You know, so they would give us a, a big wad of tickets at the beginning of tour and go, don't lose them. You're going to have to pay for your own flight. And there were, I was like part of a crew of, I don't know, 18 people. I'd fly every day. What, what were you Some doing? Some of these people, I, w- I was just a PA, P, 
PA guy. Okay. I'd stack the rear quad PA and, and load, unload trucks and all that. And probably the most important thing was like the British bands were very different than American bands. There was like a definite class thing sure. between the performers and, and those who were, you know, like a serv- I was in the it was service industry, PA guy, you know. The only thing lower was the, uh, you know, was, was the lighting guys. You know, so but you get to learn a, a lot of things from these guys who had, had been doing this, you know, for five or ten years. And you, you know, you go, you do a show, you go hang out with the whole, you know. I mean, like the uh, Keith Keith Emerson's uh, one of his uh, keyboard techs, right? He worked for Jimi Hendrix and stuff. You know, what I mean, so you could you get some, you know, and the technology was weak back then, you know. People would wrap Marshall heads in, uh, in aluminum foil to try, try and stop the hum. <laughs> <laughs> now, all kinds of silly things. I, I have so many questions. Were they flying their gear from gig to gig too? No, gear. There were four four semis, four semis full of gear. One semi just for the drum set because <laughs> it was made out of stainless steel and weighed a ton. <laughs> Took four guys to lift the kick drum. Okay. Uh, Mm-hmm. Yeah, so I all went in a truck and, uh, you know, like uh, two trucks, like uh, I guess a truck and a half of PA, some lights, a uh, backline, blah, 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 shit like that. A lot of backline. Yeah. And and I have to imagine, like, this is diving into the deep end. You were doing relatively simple audio tweaking before this, but are you just exposed to, I know you said it's kind of primitive, but it had to have been state of the art at the time. Like this, this has to be some of the most complex sound system stuff going on, right? Actually, was, I hate to say this, but it was not that complex. Okay. I mean, I, I tell people this, I go, here we are, you're doing a quadraphonic PA with 30 input channels, right? Okay. There were no gates, no compressors, no outboard EQ, right? No real effects, really. We had a uh, uh, a Revox with a very speed for tape delay, right? And uh, I don't know if you uh, you ever saw uh, around that time. I'm just like Palmer. They had a flying piano gag, <laughs> right? A piano that would lift up in the air and spin, yeah, right? And well, it was a hollow shell. And um, when they did that, they would use an eight-track player to uh, play, you know, some bad rock off thing on an eight-track. Well, he you know, and I was like, it clicks in the middle, and they were like, don't worry, no one's paying attention. You know, they're just looking at a piano floating in the air, so don't worry about that. It's like it's misdirection. Nobody's listening. But uh, other than that, it was just a lot of, you know, a lot of JBL speakers and cabinets and uh, a lot of crown power and some uh, English, you know, we had a splitter for monitors. And uh, that's the way it was. And, and is stuff breaking all the time for you to fix or not really? No, no, no. This stuff was, it was made to, you know, you're, uh, all this stuff was made to tour in Europe because they brought this PA, an American PA, basically American amps, American, you know, enclosures and stuff like that. They brought it over to America because they didn't want to. They wanted to, you know, because using the same PA for an entire tour was kind of a new thing Got in the it. early seventies. You know, a lot of times you'd use the local PAs or bands didn't carry it. You know, they'd just carry backline in the back of a twenty foot rider truck or something. You know, and use some kind of. It was a bit, bit hit and miss, you know, carrying it. First band I, I mean, like, first production rehearsal I ever went to was Alice Cooper. Uh, and uh, right after Billion Dollar Baby, they were getting ready to do a swing of dates in, uh, uh, in the fall into the winter. And the uh, son, the amplifier manufacturer, had offered them a, a free back line, right? And I was a pretty pretty knowledgeable guy, so they said you need we want we're going to send you down to deal with these guitar players because you speak their language and you can help them get a backline for this. And so I went to these production rehearsals and I learned a lot by watching, you know, a a big band rehearse. Right, and it was also the first time I saw the man behind the curtain. You know, they had an offstage keyboard player and an offstage guitar player behind the curtain wow. to fill the sound out. 
and I was like blown away. Why are they behind the curtain? They're like, shut up. No one's supposed to know they're here. I was like, oh. You know, because at that time, I'm like 22 years old. This was like, you know, like, this is all new. You know, I'm like, really? You know, you begin to, to find out. Not everything is the way you may have thought it was from reading Rolling Stone. Yeah, I remember, too, there's very little media there. You know, I mean, uh, you know what I'm saying? There's like, you really, the first time I had internet access was like 1995, right? Sure. This is 1972. You know, it's basically, you, everything was, you know, uh, somebody would tell you. There was no book. Yeah. You know what I mean? You'd learn from the guys who, you know, who, who were doing it at the time. And you pick up these little pieces of info. Same thing with the guitar thing, too. You pick up a little bit of info, you know. And uh, my thing was, this is a, an interesting story, uh, actually. It's that through Sun, right, I started to do stuff with a, a music store in New Jersey, right, called Pastore Music, right? And they were, you know, they wanted to take on Manny's, right? And, uh, and so they were giving really good deals on stuff, right? And they had me... I designed a logo for them and a sticker. It's like the last things I did from my art background, right? Was, but when I was there, they had a guitar repair guy named uh, Ronaldo Oldafini, right? A, a Italian guy, an Italian guy, right? Mm-hmm. And he was like, you know, he was like my own private uh, Diaquisto or something, you know, and I could, you know, because uh, he would help me. But why, why does, you know, why, why does the action go up when the, when the weather changes? And he goes, Oh, Bobby, let me tell you about the trust rods. And I was like, what's that? <laughs> you know what I mean? And he was, you know, he was a luthier. He was a true luthier. He wasn't a bolt together strat guy. I mean, he, he had piles of wood and he's still around too, still making guitars. Wow. But, you know, he, he kind of hit me to, to a bunch of things, you know? And then like, when you can, when you're the guy, and someone goes like, oh, man, I can hardly play this. What are we going to do? Do we have to send it to that guitar repair guy in Nashville? And I, I learned how to cite the fingerboard. I went, oh, no, I think I can fix this. And they're like, what? You know, and it's like, I had a truss rod wrench. And most people, a lot of Gibson players, right? And I could just take that truss rod wrench and just do a chord or turn, and all of a sudden the guitar played great, you know, and then became a god, you know? <laughs> Seriously, I mean, they broke something. They sent it to, to you know, to uh, the usual repair guys were uh, Danny Gatton sure. in D.C., mm-hmm. right? And then uh, to some of those, uh, some of the Nashville guys. Randy Wood or who, you know, who would that be? Yeah. Yeah. Well, like, you know, you, you sent it to to Gruen. He had a shop, oh, right? Sure. And there was yeah. the old time pick and polish. Yep. I know I sent a guitar there to have a, a headstock repair done. I thought that was, you know, that was it. And the same thing too, that um, also uh, through the, uh, I had my local music store was a place called Mascara Music in Belleville, right? And they had these two repair guys who had Dennis Electronics, right? It was Dennis Bonk and Dennis Kager, right? Who were both really smart guys. Uh, Kager has passed away. He used to work at Ampeg because Ampeg is a Jersey company. Sure. Linda, you know, 20 minutes on the, on the turnpike away from where I live, where you could go down to the Ampeg factory. You could go to Guild because Guild was in Hoboken. Sure. Right. And the fact that you showed any kind of interest in, you know, cause this is really, you know, I'm talking late sixties into the early seventies, you know, the guitar boom was over, <clears throat> but the American music boom was starting to break, you know, big time so you know if you know how to fix if you could solder and you knew a couple of tricks you were all of a sudden you know a go-to guy you know were you i had i was fearless too man i can you want me to put want me to put a pickup in i put it new york doll said we have flying v we want to have three pickups in i'm like i can do that and i just chisel the hole (laughs) (laughs) Were you were you at this point on your own? Were you living with your folks still and tinkering with guitars back at yeah. home, or where was your space to yeah. do all this stuff? At the re- at the rehearsal place. Okay. Right, I worked there six seven days a week. Sometimes I just you know I just I had a car. I drive out there. I do my thing, and then go hang out. 
right, afterwards, go to Max's Kansas City and hang out and meet David Bowie and meet Lou Reed, and meet all these other guys, you know, and, and like somebody would go like, hey, this guy fixed my guitar. And I was like, oh, you know. <laughs> wow. I didn't want to be a guitar repair guy. Yeah. Repair comes in. I mean, there was a point like five years later when I was tired of touring. I, I, wanted, I, still, I figured I still had a couple of good years left in my life uh -huh. that if I wanted to be in a band, you know, this is like just like I think I was, I was about 27, 28, and I'd spent basically five years full tilt in the touring industry and in rehearsals and with pro bands and stuff. And I said, like, if I don't do this thing now, I'm never going to do it. Right? I don't want to be in the band still and with all this knowledge I accumulated, you know? And uh, so I got a job on 48th street uh, selling guitars. At where, Rebuy, and where was right? that? Cause I had done all that business on 48th street. Okay. That's a place in that. And in, in one block, there were like seven music yeah. stores. Did you, um, what yeah. store were you at? I was at what, what they used to call little we buy. It was the original we buy very small storefront. Right. And then uh, Mr. Friedman, he got, uh, he was a wheel and dealer guy. He got a really big space across the street. Like it was gigantic, you know, uh, like kind of like Manny size space, right? He was moving there. So he sold the lease to his son. <laughs> that explains a lot about Mr. Friedman, right? And so I worked for the little we buy. But of course, across the street, you know, at the big we buy, um, they had a repair guy too, who would, you know, who would tell you a little thing. You'd learn these little things. Like he goes like, and I go like, Jake, you know, this, the G string on this guitar, it's buzzing. He, he'd look at it and he goes, the nut slot is too slow, is too low. And I go, how do I fix that? He goes, well, if you could make nuts, you tell the guy he needs a new nut and you charge him $45 for a new nut. He goes, if you're stuck in a gig, he goes, a little bit of super glue and some, uh, well, I'm trying to remember what the powder was. There was some kind of powder that we would, you would put a drop of glue in the nut slot and you could use, you could use like, you know, bone dust, but there was something else we used to use. I can't remember. I'll, I'll remember. I'll get you that before this ever comes out. Yeah. Okay. But you put it, you put that in there. And I remember the thing was, he goes, don't breathe it because the reaction between this powder and the super glue put out some toxic yeah <laughs> goes, just drop it and stand away right? and then you can use you know he told hit me the nut files and things like that and also you know secrets these little itty bitty secrets yeah i sold a lot of guitars to a lot of famous people there too which was kind of hilarious you just you just it's like networking you know in the pre-internet age now everybody knows everything and everybody thinks they're an expert you know uh on all kind of stuff, you know, and then begin to, you know, I tell people all the time, I go, you people are obsessing about details. You know, I, I would say like, make music, right? That's what it's all about. You want to sit here and talk about this Rosewood, uh, uh, you know, why is Ebony brighter than Rosewood? And I'm like, listen, you're playing electric guitar. It doesn't matter. You know, it really doesn't, you know, you're really, it's just a, you know what I'm saying? You're not on an acoustic guitar. You may notice the difference on a solid, but you won't, you know, and it was like, like in the 70s, in the late seventies, we used to call it the brass age. Everything was about brass, right? Brass bridge, brass nut, you know, I'm putting a brass tail piece on my Les Paul that weighs two pounds. You know, it's like heavy, heavy is better. You know, like a, a 12 pound LS Paul will sound better. You know, like, no, you'll have a backache. <laughs> you know, so. Did you go to uh, Labue Guitars ever? Yeah, uh, uh, well, um, that's Guitar Lab. Oh, Guitar, Guitar Lab, Lab yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, I went there. That was like uh, the hipster, hipster place. First, it was on, it was in Greenwich Village. And then it moved up to uh, around the corner from 48th Street. And there were a lot of, you know, I learned a lot there too by asking questions. I interviewed Woody Pfeiffer there, who worked there. Brilliant. He was brilliant, 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 brilliant. Yeah, he's, he was he was like the best fret work guy on the planet. 
No, he's a brilliant luthier. How is he? Is he good? I haven't talked to him in, in, in quite some time. He's good. He's, um, I forget where he is. Uh, he's upstate, though, taking care of his mom yeah. and, and doing, uh, still still mm-hmm. doing some pretty amazing, you know, he was just trying to describe these, like, chambered bodied things that he's doing that sound mind-bogglingly yeah. cool. I've seen a bunch of, I knew he was, he was still doing it because, um, like, uh, I saw a couple of his instruments over at Lark Street over at Buzzy's place uh, over there. And I was like, well, that's a Pfeiffer guitar, isn't it? You know, because like doing the, the, the Becker goes into the, uh, the deep dark world of uh, the small builder. Right. You know, I mean, it was, he was pretty much Gibson Strat kind of guy. He really didn't realize that there was this whole undercurrent of people building other guitars. You know, uh, I mean, he said, he said, I'm, you know, I use these to desk. And I burst out laughing. Like, I remember when he was a repair guy at Rondo Music in in Jersey, right? And then uh, he came over, and Ken Parker was doing repairs at the Little We Buy too, and Tucker Barrett. So I mean, there were some real real woodworking guys. And I remember going up because the third floor was the repair place and the offices for the Little We Buy joint, right? And so he had you know uh, Parker and Barrett there, and uh, um, Roger would come over from Jersey, right? I went up there once, and they were on the, the three of them were tapping pieces of wood, right? Mm-hmm. And it's all oh, you know, you have to find this resonant piece of wood, right? And I was like, no, I don't know about it. maybe on an acoustic guitar or an arch top. And I said, like, I don't know really uh, about this, uh, you know, how much resonance you need when you're plugged into a hundred watt high watt, really. You know, it's going to res- that resonate everything down the block, you know. So I was more about the. They were more about the art. I was more about the 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 actual usage. You know, you want a guitar that'll stay in tune, and play. Sure. You know, with a volume control that works, and just because that's what you need to get your job done. You know, utility utility purposes. You know, and I got to see when I worked on Forty Eighth Street. I saw hundreds of guitars, hundreds, everything. For, you know. Everything known, everything known to man came by there, you know, because like Larry, Larry Friedman, Mr. Friedman, right? When I was selling things to him, he would sometimes impart these little bits of wisdom, right? He goes, uh, he goes, you know why people sell me guitars, Bob? And uh, I go, because they don't want them anymore? Because there's two reasons people sell guitars, Bob. That's Number one, they need the money, right? And I go, and what's number two? They need the money. <laughs> you know, and it was, <laughs> and it was, it was an, you know, and well, like, oh, because, you know, it's part of like detaching from like the, oh, this is, you know, it's a tool. You know what I mean? It's a tool to make music and not to obsess about. I mean, I, I, have, I have my obsessive periods of things, you know, where a, a great old guitar is still a great old guitar, but a lot of them weren't so great, you know, because they were manufactured, there was, you know, manufactured instruments, you know, and like every now and then there'd be a really good one, you know, but that's what happens when you see hundreds of instruments come through, you know, and get to play hundreds of instruments. You know, you begin to 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 see that, like, you know, like we used to go. It goes, fuck those flame top guitars. They don't sound anything as good as a plain top guitar. Which is it true? Well, I I I don't know. Like, people could, you know, you could argue that now, but it just seemed to be empirically testing that, like a, the the plain top Les Pauls tended to sound better. You know, I mean, I, you could start an internet argument that would go on for decades. Uh, everybody would hate me for even saying that, you know, but uh, there's just something about it, you know, and I, I do understand the process of wood. I learned that from, from, uh, from Ken Parker and Tucker Barrett, you know, about, about why quarter sewing and why this and what the, you know, why, how wood is cut does have an impact on things. I just saw a, one of the guitars that was made in that shop on reverb, the guy was asking $6,500 for it's nice. I'm just like a 12 string, right? One of four made. The others were, were uh, I think Lou Reed had one. 
Pete Townsend had one. Nile Rogers had one, and this was the fourth one, right? Okay. But because the guy didn't know all that, he knew that, but he didn't know who built it. That guitar went from sixty five hundred bucks to two thousand dollars in like a week. And it's still on there. It's kind of sad. I was gonna, I, I was going. I should just call one of my clients and go. Why don't you just buy this? And I'll write you a letter telling you what exactly, you know, what was really going on here. It's actually a very special instrument. Uh, and uh, I probably have pictures of it being made somewhere. Uh, Thousands so. of people are going to try to figure out what guitar that is right now. But uh, well, Guitar Man, you know, it was made uh, Guitar Man guitar. It's on Reaper. It's Guitar Man guitar. It's a twelve string, two thousand bucks. I don't know what shape it's in. Sure. Right now, you know, uh, but that was it was made out of good good wood. You know, it's a nice guitar and. Uh, but, you know, I mean, it comes down to it's like, it's all about the hype. You know, that's the problem of the internet. You know, if they if they had said who actually had built that guitar and where it was built, it just says the guitar man guitar. Because that's what happens, like, you know, uh, to these things. They get out there, and, they, and I think it had a little de- decal that said guitar man, 48th Street, something like that. And people are like, ooh, I don't know anything. And there's no way to look it up, because there's, in the pre-internet age, there weren't you know, web pages. There weren't, you know, uh, you know, the, it was in the dawn of. Well, actually, I wouldn't. I guess dawn's not a good idea. There's there was always small builders, always. You know, homemade guitars. Yeah. I see, and when you travel a lot, you tend to you run into some of these things. You know, I mean, like I saw some really crazy guitars in Springfield, Missouri down there you know and i was like what is the purpose of this he goes oh it's a tenor guitar that the chief of police of springfield missouri made and it was like a wild body shape like made by someone who had you know just wanted to stand out from the crowd you know kind of like uh oh god i'm having brain freeze to tell who's the guy up in the northeast who made the ian hunter uh uh, Maltese cross guitar. Oh, uh, Harvey Thomas. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There was there was Harvey Thomas Northwest. everywhere. Yeah. I love that stuff. Yeah. yeah. The Infernal Machine. Was there anything? Like, we'll get back to your your work in the circus being a sound person, but um, was there <laughs> when you when you traveled? And it sounds like you traveled like few of us ever have. Were there ever were there any guitars where you're like, I, I'm just going to look for these and I'm going to buy it no matter what? Were you gravitating towards any specific models, or were you always kind of this had this utilitarian mindset? You look about around, this? you know. But uh, honestly, it was like if you if you were buying them to turn over, you stuck with Gibson and Fender. Yeah, because they're a fast turnover, right? Um, juniors were cheap. I mean, really cheap, like seventy five dollars. You could, you know, what I mean, I mean, I remember I, went, I was in a, a pawn shop in uh, in Arizona, and uh, I was in there, and I go, "How much for that that uh, messed up Sunburst guitar?" And they go, "He goes, oh, that Gibson Junior, seventy five bucks." And I go. All right, I'm going to take it. I have to go back. I have to go and uh, get some money. You know, so I come back and uh, I go, I'm here to pick up the guitar. He goes, $125. I go, wait a minute. You said 75. And he goes, it comes with an amp. And he pulls a Tweed Deluxe up. And I was like, oh, Tweed Deluxe, 50 bucks. I'll take it. No problem. Let's go. That's when the shit was fun. You know, I mean, like the, the other thing too, is that I've mentioned this before and some other things that, that at one point there were no vintage guitar shops. There were, you know, there were no, you know, used, everybody wanted to sell new because that's how they stayed in business, right? They bought their most rights, their Rickenbackers, their Gibsons, their Fenders, their Ampegs, all that kind of stuff from the company. It was a regular business and some, they'd some take some stuff on on trade-ins, right? When people started to look for the old guitars, right, there became these guys in every city who would come down to your show because they didn't have a brick and mortar store. They were working out of their house, right? Like Pete Alanoff 
right, from St. Paul, Minnesota, right? He would he would come and bring stuff for you to look at. Right. His thing was like, so I'm gonna give you a really good break on this Esquire on this fifty five Esquire. It's five hundred and fifty dollars, which you have to promise if you sell it, you sell it back to me. Right. Okay. Think about buying a fifty five Esquire for five hundred bucks. Yeah. These days. And that was like, I don't know, seventy five, seventy six. You know, so sometimes they'd come to you. You know, other times I mean, even, you know, into uh into the nineties. I would go go you know if you had a vehicle you could go cruise around to guitar stores and look for things that were interesting you know because there's a lot out there kind of kind of got ruined by the internet because everybody thinks anything they have now is worth a lot more than it actually is you know it's old sure. I'm like that doesn't make it good you know what I mean that's just, you know what I mean you can buy a brand new guitar that's great. I mean, if you if you all you want to do is play music, you can buy a Squire guitar that probably plays better than than a third of the vintage guitars out there, because all all the details, all the mystery is gone, right? All the guys who love the old shit are now working for Fender, or there's I have a pal who's who's a luthier who could barely pay his rent, right? Who now what he does is he sets up offshore factories, so the frets are in the right place. Sure. You know, because there's a lot, a lot of mistakes made in that. You know, and and uh, you know, you know, and how to source wood, and telling people that maybe nine pieces of of some kind of really low grade mahogany or some kind of you know uh, is not such a great idea. You know that, you know that. Uh, so you can you can buy really good guitars. Every guitar, you know, it's hard to find a bad guitar these days. To be honest. Yeah. You know, uh, depending on which one, you know, I mean, you could buy a, uh, uh, like a $99 made in, in Indonesia guitar or something like that. And once you realize that, you know, if it's straight, you know, if the neck functions and it's threaded right and the frets are in the right place, right, that the, the pickups and the hardware and all that kind of stuff, you probably have that sitting in a box at home to ma- and, and have a, a, a working man's guitar, yeah. you know, without paying. $5,500 or something like that. You know, it depends what your end same thing is. If you play, you play, you know, and that's why sometimes I like the, you know, and I understand, you know, I've sold enough guitars in my life to uh, understand the player mentality versus the collector mentality to the hobbyist. Right. And, and like, God bless them all. I say, man, you know, it's the hobbyist or the, you know, let me just say this, right? That uh, I was working for a major manufacturer as uh, on an amp project, right? And during this amp project, um, one of their marketing people said, "You want us, you want us some interesting things? Let's look at our customer database." And this manufacturer, right? We looked at some some stuff that they had gotten off of. Uh, warranty cards and, and things like that. The 80% of the amplifiers they make never leave the house when they come back from, uh, when they come from the music store, 80%. I can believe that. Right. So, I yeah. mean, the 20% of the amps these guys make are actually working amplifiers that go out and do shows and stuff like that. So they sit in your music room or they sit in your office and, you know, you strum a few chords or play a couple of riffs or whatever. 80%. You know, so there's a lot, a lot of you know, uh, people who play for the fun of playing or for the fun of having something to put excess cash into, or you know, and then you get into this whole, you know, uh, mentality of people who all they do is flip guitars <coughs> over and over. You know, yeah, they buy a guitar, they keep it for a month, and the next thing you know, it's on the gear page, and they they want to buy something else, so they're trying to, you know, I mean, it comes from an old mentality of trying to get like the best flamey top. And you would keep trading and and uh, and selling until you got the ultimate top or something like that. And well, it still continues to this day, where people decide that, that a Huber is the uh, the greatest guitar ever made. And then they buy one, and after five weeks, they're going, you know, this is a really great guitar, but it's not working for me. So then they want to flip it and buy, you know, some some Swiss guy's guitar, yeah. you know, or some some guy from upstate, which is fine. You know, I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm a big supporter of, 
American craftsmanship or crafts, you know, small companies building, you know, you know, we're not building missile guidance systems here, you know, or computers or anything like that. The guitar is still kind of a simple instrument compared to a harp or a piano, you know, I mean, that you could, you know, with a little bit of knowledge, you can make your own guitar. Yeah. When we went and I, I'm the last person being the fretboard journal guy to steer away from guitars, but we, we left your sound engineering career as a, at Emerson Lake and Palmer. What was the next step okay. after the music store gig? <laughs> um, no, well, actually, actually I went from Emerson Lake and Palmer to the New York dolls. Okay. Right. And, Another and deep end British, dive. Yeah. Wait, wait, wait. Wait, and uh, here's the funny thing was, is uh, like, uh, I got this gig, right? And then uh, I went, they were still touring. I went to see them, right? And they go, how come you didn't come back out? And I go, well, I have another gig. And they go, what gig do you have? And they go, I got, um, I, I work for the New York Dolls. And they went, we can't believe your career has plummeted like this. <laughs> that you went from playing like California Jam to 400,000 people with Emerson, Lake, and Palmer to some weirdo band, right? And and I looked at them and I go, but I don't have to lift anything. And they all went, what? I go, all I do is mix the band and I fly with the band. And they were like, are you kidding? I'm like, no, that's all I do. All I do is mix the band. I don't drive a truck. I don't stack anything. I don't pick anything up. And they were flabbergasted, you know. So um, I had went from, from you know, in their eyes, going from a crappy, a crappy band, a meaningless crappy band, to being like, it doesn't get much better than this kind of deal. And it was a good gig. I enjoyed. I enjoyed working. We worked weekends. How did you get the you know, New York Dolls? Go- What's the audition process like for that? Uh, here's well. This comes back to the rehearsal studio, which was called Baggies. Right, famous sure. at one point for Jimi Hendrix rehearsing the band of Gypsies there, uh, amongst other things. That I had met, I had done rehearsals with them at this. It was the only place to rehearse in New York at that time. We're talking seventy two, seventy three. You know, it was the only place that had. There was a two two floors of a giant loft in what is now Soho. So you could go and you could, you know, and it had backline in a PA. You could just show up with your guitar and play your heart out, you know. And so I've met them there and I had done some guitar stuff for them. I put a third pickup in a fly and B and did some simple, you know, you know, make it so, uh, so the guitars would, you know, I knew how to deal with a nut, you know, to, uh, how to make it so it doesn't do that kink sound when you're tuning it, you know, sure. and uh, they, they were all, you know, they they were big clients of, of Larry Friedman up that we buy, too. You know, they're always buying guitars left and right up there. And I could make them play a little bit better. I could do some simple things, you know, and so I was plugged in. I was supposed to actually go work for them before. Emerson Lake and Palmer, like I said, you know, but it didn't work out. You know, I actually went and they said, no, you got to, we're doing this thing. We're starting with this, this thing in England, you know, in, in, in October. Right. So, um, I went and got a passport and got shots and I thought I was like, oh, I hit the big time. And then that got canceled. Right. And I was sitting around doing nothing because I had left, um, the, uh, the rehearsal studio had decided to merge with Studio Instrument Rentals, sure. and uh, I was out of a job, right? So it was like, this is my time. And the two guys who had really hooked me up in audio, they had split to do like Fog Hat and um, what you call it, uh, Earth, Wind, and Fire. Okay. And they were going like, you need to get out of there and, and see the world. And I'm like, you're right. You know, so next thing I know is, you know, the Dallas thing flamed out. I got Emerson Lake and Palmer from Emerson Lake and Palmer to the New York uh, to the New York Dolls, right? And all the girls would tell me, you know, you're really good at this. You should really be working for Aerosmith. And I didn't particularly care for Aerosmith. It was the same management, New York Dolls. See what, see what I'm getting at? It's all about who you know, and it's all Clearly. about the networking thing. Yeah, you know, to this day, it's the same thing. You know, uh, that today it's like you. I don't know. I want to get that deep into it, but it's all again it comes to who you know. You know, you get everything is by referral. You know, I mean, like, yeah, I, I mean, I've been doing this like fifty years now. I've done every show on, uh, 
played everywhere you could play, you know, and even then now it's like, now I'm at the point of like, I'm very picky about what I do. You know, it's nothing like I don't, I'm at a point in my life where I don't want to spend six months of my life on a bus with people half my age who I have nothing in common with. Sure. Right? Uh, uh, it's like, I, I thought I started thinking like at the end of the set, when I left, stopped touring the first time, to use all this knowledge that I gained and, and find a way to make a living off of that. And that brought me into, you know, musical instrument manufacturing. And, you know, it's like some people will say that I'm responsible for, for BC Rich because I bought a, I saw a BC Rich Mockingbird and bought it and then took it to Aerosmith and then Joe started playing it. And all of a sudden they went from make. You know, the demand went from 20 guitars a month to like 100 guitars a month. Right? Same thing with Charvel. Charvel, we used to buy, I used to buy jack plates from them, metal jack plates for less ball. So it wouldn't, the plastic wouldn't crack. And instead, you'd rip the screws out of your, the body. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Unbreak, you know, stainless steel tremolo bars for straps and shit like that. You know what I mean? Like merchandise stuff, stuff that you couldn't, you know, you couldn't find. You couldn't find like um, the metal Telecaster knobs, you know, fender knobs, right? You know, we yeah. back in the 70s, where do you buy that? You don't, they didn't have them at your local music store, you know? So you needed these parts, you know, because, you know, when you're out in, in Dubuque, Iowa, you know? <laughs> sure. It's kind of hard to replace the jack plate on a 58 West Ball Custom, you know, that... He, you know, crashed into his amp or the drum riser or something and bent it, you know, and then good, you know, I learned how to make good cables that didn't break and things like that, you know, so I got slowly got into MI, you know, and like I was, uh, I was always kind of gear, you know, always wanted to know what the cutting edge gear was, you know, and back in the early 70s, it was Hammer, BC Rich, Alembic, uh, Charvel. Mm hmm. You know, all that kind of stuff. It was, you know, not a little more space. You made you stand out in the crowd a little more, you know, because everybody was playing a Les Paul or everybody was playing a Sumber Strat or something goofy like that with a big headstock. I mean, is it is it safe to say when bands would hire you, it would be kind of almost a two-for-one deal? They'd hire you to be a sound guy, but you'd end up being the guitar and amp tech too? Well, you know, I, I now because you can't do both at the same time. I mean, I had quite a lot of knowledge, and I could I could help people out. You know, help them define what they wanted to do. I've only like did guitar tech gigs for like maybe four people. Okay. In in fifty years, and I only toured as a guitar tech once. I did Mick Fleetwood Zoo. I took care of uh, of. Uh, you know, the instruments for that. And that was like for three weeks, you know, and it was like, okay, it's kind of interesting, you know, uh, but for the most part, you know, I stick with the, the live mixing thing. Cause I, uh, but nowadays there's a million guys who, who can, you know, mil- uh, lots of good texts, you know, I mean, all the, all the information's out there. I tell people, you know, buy, buy, you know, Dan Earl Wines book and buy Richie Fliegler's book, how to, you know, how to make your electric guitar play great. I go and you know ruin a couple of get of your own guitars and eventually you'll you you know I mean I'm telling you for like a hundred bucks which <laughs> you can get some basic tools and those two books and you're on your way. Sure. What I I need you to riff for a little bit on the art of live mixing because that is one thing that okay. they're the books and you can't watch a YouTube video to tell you how to mix a stadium concert. Oh, sure you can. This is dead. Well, nobody. Well, the ones who are good at it, they don't want to tell you. <laughs> you know, um, and I get that. You know, I mean, it's like to be honest, the bigger the gig, the easier it is usually. And the PA is so much easier nowadays. It really is. You know, uh, the, it used to be about coverage. But, uh, well, okay, you have to understand balance, how how the instruments all work together, right, and what the, what the audience needs in order to have an enjoyable time because their tickets pay your salary, you know. And it's, it's, it's an art form. It really is, you know. I mean, there's... There are people who are technically great engineers, 
but they don't get the balance right. Things are, you know, it's sort of like, there's no bass guitar. And it's sort of like, well, it kind of conflicts with the kick drum. And I'm like, dude, you need to listen to some records. You know what I mean? Because it, it, it's like the way that, you know, Jeff Beck said something to me uh, once that really stuck with me. He goes like, why don't kick drums sound like kick drums? Just listen to the kick drum on, on like a Howlin' Wolf record or, uh, you know, or on any of these other records. It's not as loud as the lead vocal. It's basically kick drums a punctuation point in music, you know? And, uh, and all of a sudden over a period of time, it just became like people were very proud of their drum sound. So the drums are very far forward because it makes people's head bop and all that, you know, but there's a lot of other, you know, you need to be able to have, make the music sing, you know, and that's with getting the balance, right. You know, it used to be a lot harder, uh, because the technology wasn't there. And now that there's all this technology, you have to lean more on your system engineer. There's another engineer who's basically his job is to make to optimize the PA and to make sure that the PA, you have good coverage everywhere the audience is. And that's his job, right? So that just leaves the artistic bit to me, you know, because I used to have to walk around to, well, you know, I used to take the lead singer up to the, up to the nosebleed seat so he could hear that they could hear his vocal up there, you know, and it's like, but nowadays you don't have to do that because you can get really good coverage, right? Because the technology is there, you know, I mean, uh, you like the, if you're using like Claire Brothers or, you know, uh, Sound Image or any of those companies, it's, it's like this, everything is as good as it can ever be. Sure. In any kind of venue, you know, so it's the, the running joke among me and my friends. It's like, great. Now we have nothing to blame. You know, it's like all pilot error now. You know, it's all you making a bad choice to do something. You know, it's funny because like um, through the Internet, I've, uh, I have I've met all these collectors who collect live tapes and who are all so happy to send me tapes of shows I did in 1975 and 76. <laughs> and sometimes you sit there and you go, Hey, the balance is good, but I was really kind of overusing that phaser flanger thing on the drums. <laughs> That's a bit dated, you know, it's like, uh, but, uh, you know, it's, do you want to talk about the technology and you want to talk about the art thing? Well, you know, I, I kind of, of more the art thing, just because when you say balance, I mean, everybody has records where it's such a subjective thing. There are records where that balance in 20 with 2020s ears sounds off. There's too much bass. There's too many. The vocals are too prominent. Right. So yeah, I get that. Are okay. you making that Here's decision or are you basing it off of what oh, the yeah. band is telling you or what the last album sounded like? I, don't, or... I never listened to the band. <laughs> What the hell do they know? You know, <laughs> you know uh, and I mean, that was, I was not worked with some from fabulous musicians and, you know, people that I worked with in 1975. I still talk to on a weekly basis. I haven't worked for some of them since, since the mid eighties, you know, but we're still in touch because it becomes like that, the shared experience, you know, you were in, in the trenches together in World War One, you know, and there's a kind of a bonding thing, you know, where it's like we survived all of this and we're still here, you know, but the, um, I always based it on records that you would, you know, uh, the thing that got me is when you listen to like the, the 50s, the 40s, 50s, uh, into the 60s, you know, like, you listen to these records and like some like the like my my father he loved big bands right and then when you when you you listen to this and like yeah saxophones trombones where's the guitar you know and but you begin to realize that they went in there and they played this stuff right and you know they go in on a day off they record a bunch of songs and then they go off and play shows right and the pur the purpose of the record was so you could hear those songs when the band wasn't around, right? So they would have to have, you know, and like they're using, what, three mics or something like that. When you look at listening to some of these old blues records, you know, that 
that's where you develop, you know, the thing about balance, where you listen to, you know, what what the music should sound like, right? And you try and bring that over into, you know, the you know to the listeners. The listeners, if they're listening, you know, they listen to some record hundreds of times. I'd see this with Steely Dan, right? Uh, where they, they would, people lived with those records for 30, 40 years, right? And they want it to be, they don't want it to be radically different from what they hear. You know, it's like when I was working for Steely Dan, like they were, were completely like blown away by the fact that they could, they would play, you know, the, this whole thing where you play an album in sequence, right? They were like, what? That's stupid. He goes, like, those are, he goes, these records were meant as a listening experience, not as a show experience. So let's use Asia as a uh, as an example, right? Asia, the best song on the record is basically the second song on side one, which is the song Asia, right? So in a live performance, you you kind of like after, at the end of the first at the end of the second song, you really played the hit, you know, and you really have to, you know, and they would be like. Why do people, you know, I said, like, listen, these guys, you know, people live with these records for years and years and years, you know, and uh, they they used to that order and they want to hear it in that order. So they used to do it. Uh, they got into it and uh, they do this thing where they would do a uh, they would have a uh, they were so, you know, you know how those guys were. They they would start the show by having one of the background singers come over, come to stage left and uh, put a record on a turntable, right? And then drop the needle on it. And then the band would start playing that. that and then halfway through, she would come and turn the record over at the break point. <laughs> okay. Right. <laughs> because that's, that's the listening experience. You know, we used to have a good time by putting different records up there. <laughs> rather than the action you know it didn't matter we were, it wasn't plugged into anything when they put the, the needle drop it was a sample of a scratchy record that would come on you know and uh so we put like acdc records up there mc5 live you know kick out the jam stuff like that but uh i digress no. um so the next question yeah. about this live mixing, was it more, you, you said the stadiums were sometimes the easiest ones. So it was taking that to the next step. Is it logical to assume that like the hardest things were the punk band and the tiny club where maybe you didn't even uh, no. need much of a PA? Well, here, here's, yeah, smaller venues are a bit more difficult. Right. Because I uh, and the reason being in most cases is in order to survive, they can't put a lot of money into the technology. Mm -hmm. Right. I've worked for clubs where until, you know, they wouldn't repair anything until it got to the point of where you couldn't do a show. Right. Well, you know, that uh, this is all broken, you know, and uh, it's a bit it's disturbing, you know, and it's like a punk band in a club. You know, it's sort of like you have to understand what the music's about. We're not, you know, what I mean, it's sort of like if you can hear the vocal, uh, if you can hear the vocal, it's a big success. <laughs> <laughs> sure. You know, and uh, you do you do the best job you can with the tools that you have, you know, and you understand, you know, it's like. Like a punk rock band, they're they're about like you know energy and anger and, and and stuff like that, and you just try and make the best of it, you know. And then like, if you have the sensitive songwriter, then you, you tend not you don't want to overplay that that stuff either, you know. I mean, you have to you serve the music, you know. I mean, I know too many people who who become like control freaks, you know, who are just like you got to turn down. I never tell people to turn down. I'll tell them to aim their cabinet away from me. I told <laughs> guitar players, I go, listen, why don't you just, you know, I know you need to be at a certain, your gear has to be working a certain way, you know, like a race car for it to actually, for you to function properly. Right. You know, you don't drive a Ferrari in first gear. You know what I mean? Sure. And that you need that. But in order to have, for the people to enjoy it, I suggest you either, you know, you face your cabinet off to the side. You know, and, and where you guys can hear it and play as loud as you fucking want, but it doesn't really affect. You know, uh, it's really hard to play through play to people who look like they're in a wind tunnel. 
You know, what I mean, their hair is getting blown back by the volume. You know, uh, you know, it, it's difficult for a band to to relate to people who look like they're in agony because you're just blowing their their head apart with a four by twelve. Even now, that's it, it's sort of like technology's changed in that. There are all these people use Kempers now, and um, which I like. I have no problem with them. You know, it's just uh, it it makes it easier for me. You know, it really does because uh, some good guy guys who have good profiles, man, oh man, you get all the good stuff without any of the bad stuff. You know, and. Uh, What's uh I mean it sounds like they they should be insured with Lloyd's of London but what are you, what's your situation with your ears is your hearing held up throughout all this Yeah you know what people people tend to forget that it, it's like it's all about cons- it's about amount of exposure right you play a really loud show for an hour right I'm usually like in an arena or uh or even in a theater I'm s- 60 to 100 feet back, you know, and I, I control, you know, what's going on, you know, I mean, like no, no amp, no wall of amps is really going to get back and travel all that, you know, especially in a packed house. Yeah. Right. So I'm there and there, you know, I've learned, this is interesting. Uh, I'm, in Europe, they're very, they're, it's, they're very concerned about decibel levels, right? And the government's involved. You do shows, and there's like a government agency there who's measuring your volume. And it's like it's hard to do a rock show at 100 dB. It really is. The crowd's louder than that, right? But the thing is, is that how you beat that is that there's a that most of those things average over a period of time. So if you're when your band stops and starts, right, and they talk, you know, to the audience or whatever your average DB goes way down. So the thing is like, yeah, if you're working for a band like Motorhead, where it's like, you know, like, you know, 120 DB for an hour, you could suffer some damage, right? Most bands don't do that, right? There's always some space, right? And then I always, and I take care of my ears. I never use headphones anymore, right? Uh, uh, when I'm, uh, I tend to uh, use plugs, when I'm just around, you know what I mean? Go out, uh, you know what I mean? Cause uh, limit the exposure. You know, I go on stage, you know, it's like I limit my exposure there. You know, I'm very rarely go up there, but sometimes people are saying, I can't hear myself. And you go up and you try and help them figure a way to make it better. You know? The singer's got the lot monitors so loud. I can't hear when I'm playing, which is a problem. Right. So, you know, you, you limit exposure. And PAs nowadays too, they're they're not as as brutally harsh as like a seventies, early eighties PA. Things are, are much smoother because people the listening audience, you know, it's like it's one thing when you were listening to scratchy vinyl, but now everybody listens to um you know, uh bad MP threes that they downloaded through earbuds, sure. you know. So it, it you know, the, it's like Becker used to call it the death of high fidelity. You know, that the audience is not, you know, because remember, I don't know if it was true of you, but you should, when I was growing up, it was all about how good your stereo was to listen to to music. I mean, there was know? that there was now that whole period where people, you know, it's probably your dad was probably into some of the stuff of, you know, hand building Dynakit amps. And then sure. the, mm-hmm. the boom boxes kind of took over in the eighties and, and people kind of lost track. Well, the you know, I don't even, buy, I don't even blame the boom box. I blame the, the, uh, the demand for convenience sure. over, um, you know, fidelity. You know, it's sort of like, I go like, why don't you just, why don't you get wave files? And then it's like, wave files, I'll, I'll eat up all the space on my hard drive too fast. <laughs> yeah. I go get another hard drive. You know what I mean? It, it, it's, it's like, you know, the MP3 thing really bothers me, you know, because yeah, I can hear the compression and it doesn't sound right to me, you know. And earbuds too, it's sort of like, I don't know if I want a little speaker in my ear canal. You know, because there, there's there's something about the environment. You know, when you have like a pair, a nice pair of speakers. Me, me at home, I listen to Dyno Audio speakers. A little powered speaker. Becker turned me on to them. 
right? And it was like only the second time in my life where I said I could put on, I put on a record and heard that I knew really well and heard things that I'd never heard before. You know, and that's like a six hundred dollars speaker, six hundred dollars each. Wow, you know, with an amp in it. You know, Dyn Audio, boom. you said. Dyn Audio, yeah. I think it's some. I think it's European. Did uh, did the live sound experience ever segue into you engineering records? Yeah, I'm dead to, I, Yeah, records to me is like dentistry. It's painful. <laughs> You know, you really, it, depending on who it is, you know, and what their vision is, you know, I did a thing in the nineties, early nineties. So I took another break from touring, right. And I started making, I became the Roger Corman of, of alternative <laughs> records, right. Where I could, I, I could, if you had 10,000 bucks, we could do an album, <laughs> right. Reverse engineer from the I'm dollar serious. amount. Okay. If you if you could come up with ten, if they say oh, we only got seven, I go ah, oh, we can make that work too. <laughs> okay, and uh, and make records because I knew ways. You know, there's ways to do it. You know, we would, you know, in the pre Pro Tools age, especially, there was uh, ways to do it really, really easy. You know, I cut drums somewhere and then do the rest of it at my house. I got tired of that too after a while because I got tired of musicians calling up. Can I come over to the house and record some vocals? And I'm like, no. Are you know, there, are there recording any, at home never really works out. Are there any records of note with your credits on them? Uh, yeah, there's there's some of them. I don't know if I'd recommend anybody to them at this point. <laughs> they are kind of like, uh, you know, uh, there's a record I did. Uh, by a band called the Action Swingers, right? Called uh, Decimation Boulevard, right? That was done in five days. But <laughs> and uh, it sounds it's like a Ramones record played at forty five rather than thirty three. It's super high energy pop music, right? And I was doing like a, I did some major label stuff, but that was always like you know. There's too many, too many people had an opinion, you know what I mean? It's like I did a bunch of stuff for Sony and it, I wasn't cut out for it. I wasn't, I wasn't about, I didn't want to be a hit, hit maker. You know, I want, I, I, I kind of went to a more Albini thing. I tried to capture bands for what, what I thought was great about them. Mm -hmm. Right. And I know plenty of bands who would, I mean, I do a Swiss one band. I did their demos, right? And then they went in and they uh, they did this record for Sony. And when it came out, it was like they had tried to make them into something they were not, right? And you could you could you could feel the unhappiness on that record. That they, you know, what I mean, it, sure. it was like it was you know they their. Uh, the record company's agenda is to sell records and they will just try and modify you in any way, shape or form in order to do that. But, you know, I used to tell bands, I go like, listen, they, they would say like, well, you know, we signed this deal. Do you have any advice? And I go, be true to your music. Don't let them make you into something you're not. All right. Cause then you'll never be happy. You'll always be unhappy and you'll always be, you'll always you know, that record could have been really great if this jerk producer didn't make us do, you know, do it one, you know, one, you know, we cut drums and then we overdubbed this and it didn't sound like it. By the time it was done, it didn't sound like a band anymore. So I kind of got tired of that, you know, and uh, I got tired of, of making records fast and cheap. I mean, the, the thing with fast and cheap is that they have to be, able, it, it goes back to like those 40s and 50s blues records, right? If you, you have to be able to play the shit before you go in the studio, you know, it's the most boring thing in the world is watch people try and make something out of nothing because they only have a, you know, a fragment of an idea, Sure. you know, and it's better to play the stuff in front of people and see if people stand there looking at you like, what the fuck was that? You know, rather, you know what I mean? Well, and sure. nowadays, actually, recorded music is at its lowest point value wise ever. You know what I mean? What's um, so it's like nobody wants to put the time in to make a good record, and by the technology too. Also, you can make a really great record at home, depending on what you want to do. 
I, I have to imagine you, you must at this point have this sixth sense when you see a band or hear a band knowing whether their heart's in the right place and whether their career's going up or going down because you've seen it all. Well, yeah, you know, I mean, it, it's like I always tell people, you know, talent is only 50 percent. You know, you have to be able to, you know, I say this to guitar players and to other engineers, you know, you have to be in charge of your own marketing. You know, I mean, and nowadays I tell people, I go like, listen, you know, uh, you got some really great songs and stuff like that. I suggest you really build a fan base, uh, a social media fan base right now. You know, and, and like, if you want to make money, you'll make more money selling them a coffee cup. Mm -hmm. uh, then because you can't download a coffee cup you, you know what i'm saying oh yeah, the, the, yeah. like you know it's like right now like i'm on the fence with this like okay there's no live shows everybody wants to do a streaming event you know and i'm like i don't know if that's really such a good idea because it's gonna it it's gonna lessen the experience you know because you see a live show right you're in a room you get the 200 20,000, 100,000 people, right? And they're all there for the same reason, to listen to some band or some, to, you know, and it's an experience. You're in a room with like-minded people who kind of like the music that is being played, right? And there's an energy that comes from that between the band and the audience, right? When you're looking at a screen, right? And it's just like, it, it, it's like you're, you know, it looks like, you know, a single camera in a rehearsal room. It's boring as all hell. You know, people are used to wham, bam, video, TV and shit like that. They have short attention spans, right? Yeah. And I think that you demean the music by doing some of this. I mean, uh, you know, if you want to <coughs> sit there and do like a couch concert yeah. for people, I think that's great because people need music, you know. But the band thing, I, th I really think that if you're, you're going to... Listen, it's all about convenience now. Now they don't even have to go to a show. I mean, I, I even succumbed to that with YouTube. You know, it's like, oh, man, I really want to go to that Jeff Beck show. And I was like, wait a minute. Everybody in the world would be streaming that. You know, <laughs> is it worth the cab fare? You know, to go and hustle my way into some venue, you know, to sit there, you know, to, uh, you know, when you can, you know, you'll see if it's any good. And you go, they're not that good. It's not that this this tour is not that good. I, I don't think I'm going to go go. You know what I mean? The mystery's gone. You used to go and want to be surprised at like you know Jeff Beck pulling some kind of like somewhere over the rainbow or something like that. And now it's like you everybody knows the set list, you know, and it has clips, and you can sit there and go, you know, that's not that exciting. Yeah. You know what I mean? Of course. It's not the same as being in that environment where somebody, you know, where you see some, you know, see Tommy Emmanuel play in front of you. You go, my, oh my God, I could never play like that, right? But you watch on a uh, on, on a laptop screen or even worse, your phone. You know what I mean? It's not the same experience. You know, it, it's like you're really removed. And it's just sort of like just another diversion from your boring life. You know what I mean? <laughs> your covid hang out life yeah i i've been here I, I actually i didn't bring anything down to this wonderful place in south carolina right okay i didn't think i'd be here more than three weeks and i'll tell you it was a real it was really interesting not to touch it do you miss it Once. uh yes and no you know uh because i think that the most important time, the most important fact about this, you know, lockdown thing for me personally was a chance to clear my head without distraction, without the phone ringing, without having somebody saying like that show you're doing in two weeks. We don't have side fills, you know, and, and, and to be able to just sit in a, in a nice place without distraction and think about what was important and what I wanted, where I want to go next and what I want to do next. And what, what do I want to do if the, you know, if it's going to be another six to eight months, of no shows, you know, you begin, you begin to go like, ah, you know, ah. yeah, <laughs> maybe I should be doing something else. You know, I was going, I actually was going like, I, 
I talked I, I talked to Adam Grimm at Satellite because he did uh, he bought a laser engraver and he uh, he made a pedal with with my logo on it. I saw it, that, yeah. Right and and uh, and like I was going like uh, maybe I should buy into you know uh, maybe I should have these pedals and just do twenty five of them and have them signed and numbered and I could probably make make some dough off of it you know and then like. Whatever pedals are pedals. Well, what's the you story know. with that pedal though? Did you did you come up with that or what is it? No, yeah. no. Adam came up with it. Adam and his his guys down there. They did it. You know, uh, it's 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 got an interesting backstory though. They it's a preamp, right? And it's based on the preamp that was in the board at the Ud Sullivan Theater when the Beatles played. All right. It's, you know, so when they upgraded to something else if you know that stuff went out into you know hi-fi collector weirdo land or whatever right i guess that he had you know being a tube guy had gotten it you know somebody somehow got a couple of these preamps all right and he gave me a pair of eqs and i was like how do i use these and he goes well then you don't have you have to build a power supply and i go oh that'll just sit on the desk you know it's like i don't really you know are they any good? They're discreet, you know. I mean, it's got some gain. It definitely does, you know. I mean, it's got one knob. That's the best thing. It's either, you know, it's a, you turn it on and you turn it up and then you're done. No other choices. No seven selector switch of variations on the seam and nothing like that, you know. The pedal thing. Every, every guitar player. I mean, fretboard channels more. It doesn't really, you know. It's not. Are they? I don't know. Is your your readership really um, electric guitar balance? I always thought it was more. Of, it's of like it's a, split, but it's um our our crowd tends to be a little more old school, and I guess by modern standards, minimalist. We there are obviously magazines yeah. now just for the pedal world, and and that's not necessarily our crowd. Yeah. Look, see, with me, I'm about craftsmanship. Yeah. You know what I mean? And it's like I get your mag. And uh, I, I look at, uh, at what people are doing, right? And it, it's it's super interesting to me, you know, because I know how hard it is to survive doing that. You know what I mean? Sure. And and how you really, you have to love it, you know, because like people say to me, goes like, well, you should go back into guitar repair. And I go, you don't understand. I go, the idea of having to refret a guitar in my life right now is so like there were people who that, who that brings joy into their life because they enjoy the tools and working and the and satisfaction they get out of, out of a guitar that plays well. I go, I'm not, that's, that doesn't, my joy doesn't lie in there. You know, I mean, it's like I would rather take it to somebody, you know, it's like even, even that, you know, I can make a nut. I can make a really good bone nut, but in the time it takes me to make a bone nut, a guy who does that every day could make six of them. You know what I mean? So at that point, it's more expedient to me if I, you know, if I'm putting a guitar together and I go, you know, I'm really, I'm not a bone nut in this. You know, I'd give it to somebody else to do it. It helps them out. What were your... um... You mentioned that you you dabbled in the world of musical instrument manufacturing and consulting. What were some of the big projects, if you can talk about them, that you did? I worked on uh, on the Cyber Twin, voicing of the Cyber Twin for Fender. Wow, that was an in- interesting project because you know, unfortunately, they were coming, they were late to the party, <clears throat> and probably the, the thing that I learned most out of the experience, which was a good experience, I didn't make a lot of money. You know, but it was an interesting experience, right? Because there were two things that I really, I really learned, right? That for one thing, when we were doing these voicing things, that they were doing comparisons between amps, right? And this, this Cyber Twin thing, right? Mm-hmm. But they were behind the screen. You couldn't see what amp you were playing through, right? And what I learned from that is that the visual thing is so important to how you, you, you know, I mean, if you see an AC 30, you expect a certain thing, right? You see a 410 tweed basement, you're, you expect a certain thing from your exposure to what you think they are supposed to sound like, right? When you take that visual aspect away, people are floundering, 
right? They, I saw, uh, and I'm not mention, I will not mention any of these names. I saw these great guys who were tone gods, right? Who couldn't tell the difference between a tube amp and a solid state amp. Yeah. A, that's how good solid state has gotten at this point, and B, that without that visual reference point, it became very difficult for them to to make judgments. I learned that's that was a very important thing to learn, right? Then I spent all this time doing these voicings for this amp, right? And I was pretty happy with it, right? And then I was out on uh, I was out, believe it or not, on an in sync tour doing uh, uh doing a uh, a special guest band right and they sent me this amp right and i plugged it in and i was like i went to my own the presets because it actually has you know my name in some of these presets okay and i plugged it in to show the guitar player and it sounded terrible i was like oh, what happened right and what happened was is that when it went from the prototype to production Somebody in manufacturing had made a decision to use a less expensive output transformer, which completely changed the character of the voicings that I had done. And so it was like, that was part of like, you begin to go, it's like, you know, once you can, it's just like records. You Once you, you know, you can, you finished with it, somebody can still mess it up. You know, it's just, it's like, because at that point they knew they were late to the party on a, uh, on a modeling style. And if, even though there was a digitally controlled analog amp, but they were late to the party and they were just the margin. They weren't, you know, on a big manufacturer, the margin, you know, the margin of what it costs to actually produce versus what it costs to buy all the ad space and make room for everybody to make their points on it. All of a sudden, shaving, you know, putting a transformer that costs $9 versus the one that costs $30 is sure. a big deal. So, what do we learn from this? <laughs> Get away from big manufacturers. <laughs> well, so instead, I try, and help, I try and help these little guys out, you know, I mean, like little builders and amp guys and you know, that, that like who are, are really flying the flag for a quality item. Yeah, you know, I'm not saying that a, a big manufacturer can't do it, but I mean, historically, amplifiers are the killer of guitar manufacturers. Ask Paul Reed Smith about putting amps out. Mm, maybe I shouldn't have brought that up. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, it's because the, the parts are so expensive. And guitar players are so picky and brand conscious. It's hard to launch a new amp line. You better have, you know, financing to last it out for, you know, uh, for a minimum five, six years until you get some kind of brand recognition. You know, uh, it's it's really difficult, you know, to convince um, guitar players uh, who are actually very more traditional than you'd think, you know, and... So if people are doing something that's good, I'm there to help. And I'll turn somebody on to it. So you should have one of these. You yeah. should check it out. Yeah. This is the... That's where the whole thing with, with Walter Becker came along. Because I knew all this. I had this all this information, you know. And, like, when I started with him, he was playing to um, Mesa Boogie Amps. And he had a pair of uh, um, Bogners. Actually, he had three Bogners, you know. But... It was weird because, like the you know, he was those amps were made to be turned up, and he wasn't turning them up. I was going like, you know, you don't need this if you're going to play at this kind of level. You don't need this kind of firepower. You know, maybe you should look and try this. You know, and uh, and went into this this whole amp Doctor Z, you know, satellite. Those guys, you know, and where where amps were a lot simpler. You know, I mean, like, look at a Dr. Z or a satellite amp. If there's three knobs, that's a lot. Sure. You know, which he found was like a lot. Well, you know, he was purity of tone was his thing. You know, he, 
he wanted a certain kind of sound and you want he could he could hear he had really good hearing man i gotta tell you that guy could hear nuance like nobody else and you know i mean like I, in the beginning I'm, he would say things to us, I'm like i'm not hearing it and then after, after a period of time you begin to develop your your hearing more and more and begin to look like certain aspects of harmonic things of strings and so it's real menacious stuff you know but like when when you're working in a studio with a guy like six hours a day, you know, 30 days in a row, you begin to absorb some of these ideas, you know. I I have, so there uh, you go. I have, I think, three hours of our last interview of you just talking about the Walter Becker chapter, and we barely scratched the surface with that article that came out and I just posted online. Yeah. But mm-hmm. but um, how, for folks who don't know, how did that relationship start and what was the original... What was your original job description? I know it evolved over the years. Okay, great. This is, this is actually really funny. That in that rehearsal place that we I, talked about early on, Baggy yeah. Studios, right? Everybody in the universe was there. That's when I met Walter Becker there. They were uh, Steely, the original version of Steely Dan with Jeff Baxter and uh, Denny Diaz and all that. They came in to rehearse a couple of days because they were going to do this. this uh, you know, uh, ABC TV used to have a Friday night rock show where they would broadcast live from uh, a venue in New York. And then they would broadcast over the, you know, sister radio station in stereo. Right. So you'd have like your black and white TV, but you could turn on your radio and hear it in a great mix. Right. So I met Becker during those rehearsals there. Right. And, uh, and then they went off. I actually went to the to the filming because at that point I'd never been to a live TV broadcast, and I was curious about it. Right, so I went and uh, hung out and all that. Right, so boom, I go off to Emerson Pike and Power and New York Dolls, Aerosmith, and all this kind of junk. Right, and then uh, a dear friend of mine who I met when I was with the New York Dolls, this guy Skip Gildersleeve. Right, he had uh, gotten uh, a gig working for Walter Becker, right? And he had, and he said that this gig had become so, so all-encompassing that he, uh, he was moving to New York. He was from Detroit, right? He's going to move from New York and uh, blah, 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 right? So, at one, so he moved to New York, and at one point he called me up. He goes, listen, he goes, um, I'm going out with Brian Setzer, right? And Becker wants to do these demos, for um he wants to do some demos and he's going to record them at sir could you do that and i was like yeah i could do that all right so so i go to this rehearsal at sir and uh, i walk in and becker goes i know you and i went i go yeah baggy she goes yeah that dump and i was like yeah whatever that got me here got you there you know whatever so so he had this thing about testing people, right? So from the beginning, what is basically he was he was playing bass, Keith Carlock playing drums, and a couple of uh, uh, and a keyboard player whose name escapes me. That'll come back to me. It's not. It's not. Uh, and he was running. He was basically um, ironing out some some songs for what would become Circus Money. Right. The first thing he had me do is record rehearsals on every format, cassette, mini disc, reel to reel CD. It was a test to see if I could do that. Right. And I was like, yeah, I can do that. Whatever. You know, the worst thing about it is trying to take is the notes. I mean, it's like it's notes on a cassette, you know, it's like, <laughs> give me a break. So I did these rehearsals right, with him and, uh, a uh, good time, right? And then at, at the end of the rehearsals, he, he, he says, uh, he goes like, you know, I'm gonna I'm gonna be tracking this up at power station. Uh, I want you and Skip to be involved. I'm like, okay, right? So I went up to, uh, and really, once you move the gear in, there's really not that much to do when you block book a studio for two weeks. Uh-huh. So we would just sit there. And, and listen and stuff. It was an interesting experience. And then at one point he said to me, he goes, I could use a guy like you on the road. And I'm like, I'd love to mix your band. And he goes, oh, uh, you don't want to do that. And I go, really? And he goes, engineers have a really short lifespan with this band. You know? and, and I'm like, 
okay, he goes, I've got a way better gig for you. All right. I'm like, okay, whatever. So uh, at first, at first I was like a production, I was like a production coordinator, right. Which was basically, you know, uh, making sure that everything, you know, make the show, the show runs uh, smoothly, basically to get to, it was kind of an audition to know, to see personality wise, if it, if I worked well within the parameters of Steely Dan, right. And it worked out fine. Next year on, I became the road manager, right. And um, for them, which is basically, I took care of Walter and Donald, which is an interesting experience. Let me tell you, I could write a book on that. Uh, and, well, it's a very interesting experience, you know, because um, they're really, they're, they're both really smart musical guys, you know, and it really, you know, it was like, I remember watching Donald write out horn charts, just set, he says, I, I got this idea. And he sat down and write out these horn charts, passed them out to the, uh, to the horn players. And then they played this, these beautiful parts. And I was like, I so it's almost like, I couldn't do that. Like I, I barely, I, you know what I mean? I couldn't sit yeah. down and transcribe something in my head onto paper and then have world-class musicians play it and have it come out like that. To me, that was like I was sitting next to Bach or something. You sure. know? It was a big eye opener, you know, and, and the fact that, you know, I guess the most important, the, the thing that was interesting was, is that we're all from the same time period. Becker was seven months older than me and Donald was like a year older than me. And we, we grew up within three miles of each other. So there was a lot of common cultural stuff. Right. And you know, like, you, would, you know, we'd be sitting there, you know, uh, in catering after a brutal sound check and they'd be going, do you go to see, do you go to the Garrett theater and see the mothers of mention? I go, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know? And then we start talking about you know, all the bands we'd seen at the Fillmore and this and that, you know? So there was a kind of a common, you know, we built a trust, you know, that, that like I understood where they, you know, started to understand where they were coming from as people and as, uh, as lovers of music and the same thing too. They find that, you know, it's like, I tell people like, well, there was one point that it's like, Walter Becker was obsessed with the Who, and um, especially because he had seen uh, Live at the Isle of Wight, circa 1970, right? And that's a point for him, you know, that, that, like when we would work in, in his studio, like sometimes he would hand the guitar to me and go, You play it, I'll listen, right? And it was, it was very difficult for me in the beginning. Because he, you know, I mean, I just felt like I said, nothing I can, you know, what am I going to play in front of this guy, you know, when he wants to just listen to what some amp sound like or something like that. And I would always try and, uh, my thought, my, my way out of it would be to play things that were kind of um, way off the radar and that I didn't think he could play. Mm -hmm. Right. And I played the beginning of Tattoo, which is on the second Who record which is, has very unique chord voicings, right? And I played it, and he goes, Tattoo, did we at the Fillmore in 68 when they played that? You know, and I was like, no, oh, I can't get away with anything, can I? You know, and it was, but after a while, I began to realize that, uh, uh, I said to him once, I go, I was, you know, I go, it's hard to play. I go, you're such, you know, you're, you're, you're like, you know, a great musician, you know, and it, it's like, and I'm kind of like, not so great anymore. Cause I'm not, I'm out, I'm way out of practice, you know? And, uh, he goes, no, you're actually, you have a lot of talent. You're just confused. And I was like, Hmm, I better think about that. <laughs> I was like, whatever. But, um, what happened over a period of time is that like for, you know, for a while it was, I felt like I was the entertainment director, you know, Want to go, you know, because at one point they get into things like they want to go see all the Batman movies, Batman or superhero movies. They want to see Batman, Spider Man, blah, blah, blah. Right. And uh, it was, I'd always try and get to take them if they were up, right, to the earliest show possible because the place would be empty because they had a tendency to yell at the screen. You know, when they when they found plot holes, who wrote this? Well, 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 well. You know, this will not work in a theater full of people, you know. <laughs> but um, 
sure, the kids you know, trapped then, in then, body, male, adult male bodies. Yeah. I, listen, you know, I got to tell you, that it, the fact that, you know, you know, at one, you know, you begin to realize that there's another side to these, this serious, you know, they, they're portrayed as these serious jazz guys, right? And it's, and, and it's like, they like to have a good time as much as anybody, you know, and uh, I learned a lot. I, it's, I really, I hear differently now. Has it, 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 has it affected my, my mixing of, of other bands? Yes, it has. You know, because they, you know, there were, there were times that they would, they would hear things and I wasn't hearing it and that bothered me, you know? And so I would, I would have to, you know, I, I used to call it a tune up course, you know, where you, you'd start listening to music outside of the genre you're working in to, uh, to try and understand what made, what made that great, what made that record so universal, you know, or why, why does this, work you know and you begin to go you know with me i think a lot of it had to do with the relationship of, of uh, bass guitar to the drums right it's a, it made me reevaluate what i was doing and reevaluate um you know some of the, the tonal things uh, because you have to you you really you, you know you you just don't bring the faders up you know i mean it's a lot especially the bigger the band gets the more you have to kind of make holes for things you know if you've got a band you know keyboard players eat up a lot of space in a band right if you got two keyboard players and horn players you know uh, you know you have to really make it's a jigsaw puzzle to get it all to fit together you know that's like that would bring me back to the the high-end cable shootout. <laughs> we did a shootout of every high-end cable ever made, right? And uh, and the be-all and end-all was is that yeah, it's really great, but it doesn't work in the real world. Oh, all the cable ba- makers will hate me for saying that, but you know, in in the real world, you don't want to have you know 10k coming out of you know going into your guitar amp, you know, because, hey, the amp's not voiced to really reproduce that. So you're kind of like spinning your wheels, right? You know, and you have to sometimes take the super high end off a guitar, you know, to leave space for other things, you know, to make to make them all fit together, you know, to shave off some of that bottom end. You've spent all that money to try and get that 80 cycles out of your guitar. Well, Mr. Bass Guitar and Mr. Keyboards and Tom Toms have something to say about that too, you know. So it's a it's a drama, you know. And uh, cheap cable's best. It's I, basically the takeaway. Huh? Cheap cable is best. Well, you know, I, I wouldn't say. You know, it depends on what you're looking for. You know, if you're a solo guitar player, you know, you're playing a trio or something like that, and, and you want some kind of big, wide stereophonic sound, it may have something, you know. The amount, you know, the capacitance, the amount of capacitance in a, you know, a twenty dollar cable may, you know, you maybe you want some kind of sparkly harmonics way higher than that, you know. But if your situ- if your situation allows it, go for it. I don't care, you know. <laughs> it's, it's it's so like it may, you know, you know, if the gear makes the player happy and he plays good, job well done. I think, you know, I mean, a happy guy. Put, you know, that's why I always always like, you know what, I'm not going to tell you to turn down because then you're not going to be happy and you're not going to play as good if you were, you know, because, you know, you know, if you if you've got if if the sound makes you happy, you play better. You know, oh, that's what I found anyway, that, that like all of a sudden, you know, you're not sitting there. So oh, I wish I had, you know, uh, I can't, I can't do this. or I can't hear that or whatever. You know, you all of a sudden you, you, uh, you know, I mean, I've hit one chord. I mean, I mean, like, and went, Oh, just buy it. Because you just hit one chord. And I go, I can tell right now that this amp is, is you need to have this because you don't find amps that sound like this, you know? And, uh, that have that kind of, you know, happy harmonics or whatever is something that really tickles you and makes you play better. And and you, uh, the cable shootout reminded me that y- you were kind of, I don't know how to describe it, you were kind of Walter Becker's uh, golf caddy or something when it came to gear and advice about gear, and you really steered him towards all these, a lot of boutique makers, a lot of other makers as well, but 
uh, you guys had quite a run of uh, accumulating gear, testing gear, and oh SIR. It was crazy. It was, when I started working for him, he had 14 guitars and 6 amps. Uh, when I did the inventory after his passing, he had like 650 guitars and 350 amps, right? That's a lot. It takes up space, 350 amps, let me tell you, right? And I always love saying this, 1,300 pedals, right, for a guy who never used pedals during the show. Sometimes in Asia, he would ask for like uh, like a, a chorus effect, and he would make one of the two texts go out there like in between the first and second song and insert that, that pedal, which sat on top of his amp, right? So he could walk over there, hit the button, play the one part, take it out of the circuit. Then the guy would come and get it and take it away. Wow. Uh, And there you go, you know, but yeah, it was funny. I, it was like in Forbes magazine, his wife referred to me as the gear pimp, guitar, uh, gear pimp or guitar pimp or something like that. Because of all, you know, the like the buy, sell trade of vintage guitars, sure. I knew all these guys, right? And then I knew, you know, all these manufacturers. I mean, I went to my first NAM show in, in uh, January 1976, right? When it used to be held at the Disneyland Hotel, right? It was kind of like, you know, in their ballroom or something. It was very small, yeah. right? And you could actually talk to the people who made this stuff, right? And that was an eye-opener for me because very few people who actually made the stuff were there. It was all salesmen, you know, who were just and and the the NAM show in LA was basically a vacation for all the East Coast winter, you know, Midwest inter you know, winter guys who could get away from uh you know, the frozen the frozen east and go to California for a week and write it off as a business expense. You know, but you know, he 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 did his he did a lot of research too. He really did. He'd be, you know, I mean, like you looked at his computer, he had like, like 600 bookmarks, you know, and he'd be up all night, you know, and he'd come in the next day and goes, what do you know about this? And I go like, oh, I know it breaks every 20 minutes. Why would you want that? Well, I read on the internet. I'm like, yeah, you got to take that with a grain of salt, you know, but everybody's got an opinion, but most of them don't, you know, it depends how, you know, like any opinion, you have to evaluate the source, you know? Yeah. I mean, are you, do you work in the real world? You know I mean? What do, what do you, you know, what is the source of your opinion on something? I'm telling you, watching these guys who couldn't tell the solid state amp from the tube amp, right? Just continually get it wrong. That was a mind blower to me. Yeah. Just like, wow. Did did Becker, with this accumulation of all this gear, did he have, was this just fun for him, or did he have this sort of master project in the back of his mind that was, was he seeking a sound or an album or a concept that he hadn't tapped into yet, or was he just having a blast trying out all this gear? There were multiple f- things that were going on all the time, none of which really came to completion Mm -hmm. there were there was like a there was a really weird electronica project um that uh, easily spent some sent months um programming really uh unusual uh i think he liked it because like the song form went out the window you know what i mean because like you know one day he came in he says like dead mouse i want yeah and he goes like he goes, he starts with a really strong riff for five, you know, for, and plays it for five minutes. He goes, then he comes into a bigger riff and everybody goes nuts. And I go, yeah, it's electronica. You know, it's like, it's a different thing. And he goes, we're going to start with the really good riff. And then we're going to go to an even better one. And we'd work on these, these things, right? He, he had a blues record that he wanted to make too, you know, and, uh, I, I, he was way beyond uh, making something like like Circus Money or or Steely Dan. You know, he 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 told me there would never be another Steely Dan record wow. ever. Yeah, 
And she said, he goes, it, the fact is, he goes that like, he goes like, you know, we were signed to Warner Brothers, right? There's nobody left at Warner Brothers that I know. You know, and no one would give us the kind of budget these days that we would need to make a Steely Dan record. Sure. And suppose we spent a million five making this record. He goes, next thing you know, it's on Spotify and I'm making like a hundredth of a penny. What's the point? Sure. And nobody wants to hear anything new anyway, which is is pretty true, actually, on, on any of these heritage bands, you know, that they want to hear those songs that made them happy in high school. And they're, you know, ask, you know, any of these bands that makes these records nowadays, you know, uh, that has any kind of long career doesn't really, um, no one wants to hear anything new. You know, they would like, a, I want to hear dirty work. You know, I mean, like they would, sometimes they would play stuff from like everything must go and people would know what it was. It's just tragic in a way, you know? Yeah. Um, all this time that you've had kind of contemplating, looking back, looking forward, um, mm. what's mm. next for you? What, what, I know COVID, it's kind of a wild card. We don't know, but has it, are you, are you willing to go back out on the road it, when this clears? Eventually. Yeah. When it's safe, you know what I mean? It's sort of like, I think that's the, that's the thing, you know, you, no one's going to allow big gatherings, right? Uh, I, and when I say big gathering, let's just say a thousand people. You know what I mean? Sure. And it's sort of like it's different. If it's different for the people on stage, because but that for me, because I'm out in the middle of that. You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. Until they figure this thing out, like, and that comes back to that, to when I was telling you about the rehearsal at SIR, right, with all those people that we were all sitting around together, right, and then two weeks later, one's on a ventilator. Right. One is in such agony that, you know, he didn't think he was going to make it. Another one, uh, uh, he went back to his uh, to where he lived in Cleveland and his, um, you know, his girlfriend got it. Mm -hmm. He was asymptomatic carrier. Right. So, uh, you know, it's like right now I need to go to New York this week, you know, and I'm trying to figure out how to get there. Should I take a train? Or should I take a plane? What should I do? You know, I mean, it's like, you know, because uh, I'm and then you watch TV and they say that, like, you know, every, you know, this is it's not getting better. And they, they're suspecting a, another wave of this coming up, you know. And so I don't know, you know, uh, it's, it's like, I guess I go back back into uh, the guitar dealing for a little bit. You know, that's that's always uh, good fun. And um, I've actually, you know, I thought about doing some pedals and things like that, you know, and, uh, and like, eh, and it's a crowded market right now. And it, it's, it depends, you know, maybe for fun rather than trying to make money from it. You know what I mean? Do some silly pedals or something and pointy colors. And I talk to a lot of pedal guys, you know, and. I know what the, you know, it's like I'm friends with the people in Earthquake or in Keeley and, you know, Brad Davis who does Creepy Fingers and, uh, you know, and like Adam's got some killer pedals, you know, and, and stuff. And, you know, sometimes it's just, you know, it's like any guitar player will spend between 100 to $200 to sound better than the, the next guy. <laughs> you know what I mean? True. Yeah, and I mean, and I mean that in a in a, in a nice way, you know. I mean, because I do it, you know. I mean, when I found out that I could buy uh, a Rocket Archer, and it's, and I mean, I, and it sounded just like the two thousand dollar Klon, I was like, I gotta have one. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> for that time that I need to sound like a Klon, and I didn't want to spend that kind of money. And we, I, we, and Walter couldn't tell the difference. You know, if, if, he, if he can't, you know, that's what I said. He goes, he goes like, you guys are tricking me. I go, no, you just keep picking the wrong thing. And, and goes, well, he goes, well, so? And I go, yeah, so I'm going to go buy one of these right now. <laughs> right now. I'm going to call them up and say, will you send me one? <laughs> just a credit card. I'll take one now. It fooled him. It'll fool everybody. You know, so. Are you still buying stuff? I don't know. You know, it's like, it's a. Uh, 
uh, I think that, you know, the, uh, I thought about doing some, uh, people always want, you know, want me to write a book, you know, and uh, to be honest, I wrote a book. I shopped it around two early in the early 2000s. Okay. And I found book publishers um, to be so far behind the curve and they made record companies look smart. You know, just, uh, I was at a super big publisher because I had a really good book agent and I, I'd written a book for, for Hal Leonard before, right. About microphones, right. Work for hire $5,000. It took me, uh, I'm not kidding five days to do it. And <laughs> on a primitive word process, which is even funnier, uh, cause that was the early nineties, you know? And, uh, uh, you know, book, the books, you know, cause I got great stories, but I think the, the thing is, uh, I think it's better when I tell them because I think it's more like, you know, uh, I think it, it's, it's better. And those guys, when I went to this big meeting, they said, listen, in this genre, the biggest selling book is the dirt by Motley Crue. And uh, they go, we think you should ramp up the sex and drugs in your book. And I go, listen, I got to tell you something. I go, Motley Crue is for Four guys in a band talking shit about each other. That's fine and well, because there's a greater good. It just makes them seem more insane than they really are, right? You're telling me that I'm going to talk shit about people that I worked for, right, who are still extant and who are very successful, right, and who have like a, a, a floor full of lawyers ready to come stomp all over with me. Sure. You know, and after that meeting, my book agent said, you know, you were completely right about that. Everybody knows that some of these guys did a lot of drugs and tanked their careers or whatever. You know, what's the point unless you have some kind of deep inside info and can prove it? Like, yeah, there was a two headed baby. You know, I have pictures. You know, I changed the diaper, you know, that kind of thing. You know, so I kind of shied away from that. But I have been doing, you know, uh, doing kind of like reworking the timeline a little bit because I think there's something to be, you know, there's there's some value from uh, what went on in the 70s when things were a lot simpler, right? And and things weren't so uh, um, marginalized, I guess, you know, and and success. It depends what what is success, you know, and, and there may be something that people people could learn from. But I think that I like telling it better. I've done these things where I do it live, where people come and there's I use a moderator and he asks questions because it's it's like it's good to have somebody who's look who checks the audience out and can tell whether you're losing them. You know, if it gets <laughs> too technical, sometimes people yeah. want to know more about the blood and guts thing, you know, I mean, like, you know, I mean, it's like, you did this show and there was blood. And I go, yes, there was a lot of blood, you know, and he cut himself. No, he did not. He fell on a glass. Well, I heard, like, oh, listen, I was three feet away. Yeah. No matter what anybody says, I am right, you know, and, uh, uh, you know, there's sometimes it's more fun like that than rather than be locked into a book where they want an editor to make your book, you know, pace better or whatever. To, to me, that just smells like record company interference again. You know, the, the, it's like, as you've seen that I can, I can talk, you know, yeah. I can get on and on about, I have a lot of stuff to talk about, you know, you name a band and I can tell you something funny about them or something, you know, I mean, like I worked with Ted Nugent for five years, right? not a name I bring up very much anymore, mainly because he, you know, uh, he's, he's gotten a bit, uh, political and like, uh, if I talk to some people, I, I, I'll tell them this, I go, listen, he learned a long time ago that saying outrageous things, uh, immediately, uh, you know, changes your ticket sales. You know, he's always said outrageous things since the day I met him in the, the early 70s he'll say things he'll get a lot of press out of it whether it's true or not doesn't matter you know and he has his own you know it used to be the hunting thing everybody blah, 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 blah. i go listen i gotta tell you something i go what he hunts he eats okay i've seen it i've been to his house you know fine and well and i go i gotta tell you he was the best parent of any musician i ever worked for 
He really took care of his kids, right? And uh, he would fly home to be with them on every day off, right? So it's like, you know, it's like, yeah, he gets going. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and it's, 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 I kind of like, you know, I'm like, whatever, you know, it's like, a, but, um, you know, I still talk to him. His brother passed away. His brother, he, his brother and I, we did a tour opening up for bad company, like in early 1976. It was a lot of fun. You know, it's like his brother was the road manager and he would drive this Lincoln continental with me and the other three band members. And we would drive around Texas opening up for bad co while, uh, while Ted was, would fly. And granted he should, because the band's called Ted Nugent, not called Ted Nugent bands, not Ted Nugent orchestra, you know, whatever he was, you know, it didn't, he was what he was. He's the guy who had put in, you know, journey to the center of the mind, never stopped working. Playing Birdlands to a ton of twins. You know, so I don't know, you know, I've, I've done a lot of thinking about, about this, you know, I, I kind of, you know, uh, I keep myself in practice by talking to you and doing podcasts. I was you, know? say, you should have your own podcast. I, uh, you know, I'm thinking about it. I, I don't have the technology to do it here. You know, I mean, and and right now, is, and you know, I mean, there's there's a couple hours on Roadie Free Radio that's really that's good. Mm-hmm. There's the one I did with Joseph Arthur that's kind of good. Um, you know, which is more band centric rather, than, and then like, you know, the the article in uh, that you did in Fretboy Journal was good. You know, I mean, uh, and now this, you know, and uh, it's. I thought about it too, you know. I, I, I like the live things. I used. I also had another uh, engineer who's from the same time period as me, and our paths diverge, right, early on, and then we both started. We both came back working for um, Steely Dan at one point, right. So it, there's a lot of coverage. He went more singer songwriter. I went more, you know, about guitar thing. But we can, you know, there's a lot of. Uh, a lot of years of experience there and people want to know, they want to know what goes on, you know, uh, behind the curtain, you know, and it's like, uh, I try and give them some of the good things and try and actually say, you know, it's really, really boring compared, you know, <laughs> yeah. really, you know, it's like all that almost famous stuff. Like, well, those days are long gone, you know, cause, uh, everybody want, I always get these calls to be like a, involved in some reality TV show of a touring band, right? They go, we want to capture the drama of life on tour with a band. And I go, there is no drama. I go, in my world, you know what the drama is? The dry cleaning is late or they lost somebody's shirt. <laughs> That's what the drama is. These, these things are like military precision, you know? There's just big money involved, you know? It's like there was no drama. You know, if you want to see drama, you have to go to the little bands. That's the one where the tire blows out or the transmission drops on the van that they bought for 600 bucks that wasn't able to tow a trailer with the amount, the amount of crap that they put in. And, and it's like, honestly, there was a thing with the, uh, reality TV shows. This letter went around amongst my touring pals saying that, like, it's not a good idea they, you know, you have no, they can make you look into a chump, look like a chump really easy. It de- It's demeaning to the business. And it's a business, yeah. you know, I mean, you go out and you do these shows, you know, and it's like, there's budgets, there's a, you know, and everybody, you know, I just like, ah, sometimes I think there's no, not enough mystery. You don't need to know everything, you yeah. know. Well, I can guarantee you after posting this, there's going to be about 50 emails with more follow-up questions for you. So uh, pencil in a Fine. second well, podcast. We can do that too. You know, <laughs> we, we can do a question and answer thing one day too. All right. Let's plan on it. It's funny because like when, uh, there was this little thing going on uh, when, I, when either you posted it or they're saying like, you know, I thought, it's going to be a marathon. And they're like, <laughs> yes, you are. You are on our. Uh, we also put out that uh, Truth About Vintage Amps, po- Amps podcast, and there's a Facebook group for it, and and people were suggesting you should be on the yeah, show. Good. And uh, yeah, I, f- I could do that. Yeah, yeah. Well, anytime. Yeah, yeah you know, and it's. I like that. I think to, to me, that's that's like. Uh, I find that a really interesting uh, 
podcast thing, you know, because there's like, there's plenty of, you know, people don't realize that there, there used to be, there was a time when people made quality items, you know, they just want, you know, if they were going to make an amp or a amplifier for a film projector or something like that, they made, they used good components because they wanted to make a good item. The, you know what I mean? The margin was not, you know, they wanted to make an item they could be proud of. Sure. And I think it's really great when people are, are you know, taking some of these things and reviving them and beginning to realize that, like, listen, I could sit here and say that, like, you know, the, the whole thing is the out, is the transformers, because that's true in, in, in live audio world, too. If you've got a console that has really good transformers in it, you get a kind of punch that you can't get out of some of these other out of these digital consoles, right? So I think it's great. I mean, Becker did it too. He did, he, you know, like six, seven years ago, we were buying all these mass core amps, like, and he'd send them to Matt Welch and spend hundreds of dollars turning them into guitar amps. I'm like, why don't you just let them be what they are, you know? <laughs> but, you know, he was, he liked to keep Matt busy too. You know, Matt Wells? I don't know Matt Wells. Oh, Matt Wells. He's like, he's a he. He's the amp guy in the in the New York area. All right. Yeah. Between him and Mitch Colby, I can get anything fixed. All right. Nice. You know, you know, because it's like, you know, I mean, like you begin to realize that, you know, like I said with that that Cybertron project, when they changed the output transformer, it went from color to black and white. You know, and and like. I see these guys reviving some some amps, you know, and, and it's like you get, you know, they're made with good components and they're made to last. Like I was going, I fired it up and it sounded great. And that's because the shit was good. It was made to last. It wasn't made to have a two year lifespan and you buy something else, you know, because it was impossible to fix once it broke. I know that I broke a jack off in the Cyber Twin and in order to get the jack out of the input. Uh-huh. It became like a, I had to take the amp apart, <laughs> you know, because that's, yeah. you know, I was like, ah, that amp sits at my house now. <laughs> oh, and there's not going to want to hear that. They'll probably ask for it back now. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Night Bob. Uh, this was great. Well, are you going to cut this into pieces? Not at all. Not at all. <laughs> <laughs> you can, well, hold on a second. Uh, trying to see how long is this? Two hours. Oh, God, it's like two and a half hours. I know. Tell we'll them that, the... uh, that you hook up the other uh, the other ones I mentioned, like Brody Free Radio. There's three hours there. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, we'll piecemeal together your whole career with be, all these podcasts. Could, I could have my own channel. You should. Just talking the same shit over and over again. It's all good. But I do, and I'll just say in closing, though, I do like your magazine. I really do, you know, and uh, it was a nice, uh, and I'm thrilled to be in it. I was also thrilled to be in Forbes in Forbes magazine. Of course. It was incredibly incredibly funny. Because they called me up and they they said, like, you know, uh, we're doing this article about Walter Becker in the collection. I'm like, Yeah, and they go, Well, his wife said we needed to talk to you and I'm like, Okay and they go, Do you have a picture you uh you would like to use? And I go, well, Let me send you because they, they had sent me a picture they lifted off the internet and i said i prefer if you didn't use that picture and they go well send us one you like and i sent him a picture and now when you google me up it turns up in this forbes ad where i'm called a guitar pimp i tried to to buy the uh the domain name for guitar pimp the second that hit the stands that somebody had already <laughs> That was and that's what too it's like why would i want to really just like encourage any more of that you know i mean i've got nightbob.com you know and that's basically the sound engineering thing which is not much to look at there but i have this nightbob archives thing that i've been assembling stuff to put on there so you can spend a marathon of time looking through there's not much there now but there will be in the next uh week or two all right well, thanks, Night Bob. I, I think this is to be continued because people are going to have questions. Any time, you know, right. I've, got, I've got a lot of time on my hands these days. You know? right. So you know, pick another topic. We can talk about you know 
how, you know, what worked and what didn't work and relay, you know, like Aerosmith's relay switching in the seventies, which was so far ahead of its time. They had relay switching, uh, effects okay. in 1976. Right. And there was ca- a guitar, a- smaller amps and ISO cabinets under the stage. Right. So like, you know, I hear Metallica's engineer going, Oh, I used an ISO cabinet starting in 1993. And I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. 20 years before that I was doing it anyway. You know, it's like, well, you know, there's nothing new. You know, it's all about taking these things and making the best out of it. Thank you so much. Oh, it's always a pleasure talking to you.